Oh, we're live. And we're live. Hello, everyone. Um, how are you? Wherever you are, hello. Welcome to New Zealand, Whangarei. In the sunny Northland, we just about hit summer slowly. Uh, spring's here, I guess. I, I usually get my, um, all I know is winter and summer. Uh, my body starts creaking when it comes to winter and it gets warm and starts moving a bit more when it gets to summer. It's feeling the summer now. So thank you for joining me from wherever you are. And for, um, and you know, it's we missed out last week, but we're back on this week. And I'm quite excited uh, because um, someone who I spent a bit of time listening to who got me on the whole learning how to do a convention properly and how to look at how to do it in a way that's more easygoing at it than trying to struggle at it. And so I'm quite excited to have Alan Zia uh, from Chromacon New Zealand, um, which is a – actually, you know what, Alan – you tell us about it, because I think it's better coming from the horse's mouth than from my mouth. <laughs> uh, thank you, Aru. Um, kia ora, everyone. My name is Alan. Uh, so as Aru mentioned, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm an artist, but also I run an independent art festival in New Zealand called Chromacon. Um, so uh, I founded that, and uh, I founded Chromacon in 2013, and we run it as a, uh, what do you call it? Um, a biennial festival so that's every two years not once uh, twice every year but uh so um uh so that's a art festival that you know showcases a lot of work from independent creators across new zealand um across illustration comics um you know design sculpture a lot of different disciplines but everyone's there to showcase the original work and it's good fun excellent I don't know what I did there. I went to um, go for two for and move myself from the stream. So, <laughs> yeah, just by myself for a second there. So, how long? When did you start Chromacon? Uh, 2013. 2013. So, that's like um, seven years ago, every two years. Um, and so, 2015, then 2017, and 2019. Or yeah. what? Did you miss last year or did you do one last year as well? Um, we did one last year, so that was our fourth festival last year. Um, Excellent. Ne yeah, next year <laughs> would have been our would, would be our like you know our fifth anniversary, I suppose. That's awesome. I mean, being in the, um, you know, a lot of times it takes about what three years before you actually uh, break even, as they say, and um, you know you're able to establish yourself and people are more aware of what you're doing and stuff. Did you find it hard um, setting up something like this that around independent creators, especially around? Um, you know, trying to like be more independent rather than be more corporate. How did you, you know, reach out to people and say, hey, look, this is what we want to do. Are you interested? And how, what was the feedback like at the first one? Um, yeah, you're right. It, it is it is always quite a challenge. Um, I, I guess there was, it wasn't really a conscious decision to be, you know, more, um, you know, less corporate than other events or anything like that um, mm -hmm. because it was a very grassroots initiative from the start, you know. Um, I was motivated by, um, you know, as an independent artist myself, um, mm. I was motivated by us, uh, you know, I would collaborate with other artists to self-publish, you know, comics or um, art books. And we would, you know, either do uh, or illustration too, you know, we'd do group shows, you know, like the typical exhibitions that you would do, mm. um, or go to, uh, you know, we, you know, we, in New Zealand, we would have like pop culture conventions that are very similar to those around the world, um, like uh, mm -hmm. Armageddon or Overload or uh, as such. Um, but I guess the issue I, um, or the challenge I was facing was, you know, I did I did not do a lot of um, fan art, like, you know, fandom, you know, based mm -hmm. work, um, which is, you know, it, a lot, I know a lot of artists do that. Um, and um, the thing is, you know, I, I think a lot of events celebrate like fandoms you know, in pop culture, mm. which is which is great. But um, the issue was if I wanted to showcase only ind independent work, um, then it was a bit of an uphill battle because I had to come constantly sort of explain to people that you know I don't I don't run a um, comic shop or anything like that. You know, I'm actually I'm just showcasing things my, I made myself. Mm. And similarly, you know, I know there was a lot of New Zealand creators that's sort of in a very similar spot to me. Um, mm. So, yeah, I mean, over the period of a couple of years. Um, I guess I had a lot of ideas on how to quote unquote like improve, you know, artist alleys at you know mm. events or like how to, um, well, just like overcome that issue of like you know I really love opening nights of group 
shows because mm. um, it's such a good vibe, right? You know, everyone's there and you have artists, like, you know, fellow, your fellow artists as well mm. as like other just, you know, art to lovers. Um, and you could discuss, you know, the work with, um, you know, directly, you know, between artists and the, the, the audience. And, um, but, you know, exhibitions will run for a week or two. And, it, and it's always sort of like, do I go into the gallery today or not? <laughs> you know, um, mm. because, you know, they might, it's, it'll be like a weekday or something. So you're not sure if anyone's ever going to go. Um, but at the same time, you know, as an audience, you know, like myself, of like an ex exhibition, um, it's always good to actually talk to someone like it, you know, um, especially if they're the artist, you know, um, I, I find that quite a meaningful experience. So um, I guess for me, it was, you know, like I haven't gone to artist alleys at, you know, bigger expos and also thinking about like, you know, what makes that opening night, you know, of a, of a group show like so special. Yeah, and sort of like, why can't we have, you know, the best of both worlds, right? So that was sort of the main, um, like idea behind it, you know, um, to just really try to capture like that vibe of the opening evening, um, but have a collect collective kind of environment where, you know, artists can come and showcase their independent work without having to feel like, you know, they're competing with, um, you know, the biggest Marvel DC, <laughs> um, you know, IPs yeah. in around the world, you know, and uh, all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah. So, um, did you have a lot of interest, um, you know, like from the start, by trying to say, hey, look, this is, I'm doing this, how many people, are, you know, decide to put their hand up for that? Because I know that uh, trying to reach out to artists, because, you know, New Zealand's kind of a lot, lot of, uh, I, I kind of think of like, it's more like an insular uh, group of people, you know, more mm -hmm. introverted when it comes to art and stuff and their own creativity. And so I find, um, that when you go to group events like that, you actually meet more people and you kind of go, ah, oh, okay, so I didn't realize you were doing that. And you sort of like explore that there's more people rather than just you yourself in your little corner doing your own thing, but you have more people interested. Um, you know, like you talk about um, the group events and uh, art shows. Um, did you? Is that how you met people to come to this or how did you go about doing that? Um. I think I think you're right. You know, uh, there is a lot of um, you know pockets um, amongst um, our wider arts community, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and but there's, there's that other thing where you know everyone always says New Zealand, you know, has like two degrees of separation, right? Uh, which is actually yeah. also kind of true. So um, for me, I always, you know, I think I got into art um, via online communities. And right. even prior to something like Chromecon, um, you know, while I was at university, you know, I was I would also always try to like, um, like you know, have meetups or something with other artists, um, if you will. Mm. So there's always been a little bit of a community, like and like you know, I would I would try to do um, like group shows and publish like stuff with friends, right? Um, mm. so you know, the, I definitely floated the idea of Chromecon to people before I started it, but I guess initially it sounded more like a elaborate group show <laughs> more than yeah. you know what it is today um but as 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 you're aware like it, the thing is um i mean i've, I've told the story of like how i started Chrome Club quite a few times but the short version of it is um i started working on it um in the 2012 christmas break and the idea was you know um I've got nothing else better to do this christmas anyway so um, initially, uh, it was like I booked out a community hall kind of thing, and I was thinking mm -hmm. like maybe you have twenty to thirty artists, which was already like a good goal for me to hit. Um, but because I think people actually like responded really, you know, strongly to the idea, um, mm -hmm. so I'm on like those twenty artists, maybe you know, they all it was like word of mouth, so um, the word sort of got out like spread out there beyond like people I knew personally, mm -hmm. and and obviously you know since then. Um, as we, you know, um, get ready to launch the event, you know, when we promote it, um, I think artists have, have a better idea of what the event is. Um, so, you know, like people, more and more new artists will come on board. Um, and I think like, you know, sometimes I feel like, um, you know, I used to think I know a lot of like what's going on, you know, in the art community, but like, it, you know, I think, you know, a lot of young people get into the arts. So um, I think, I feel like with every Chromacon, I discover, you know, uh, another group of like really, you know, untalented emerging artists, um, you know, they probably like work in the same university or something, you know, um, yeah. that are like, you know, becoming a new collective somehow, you know, and then like, you know, I, I, it's always a surprise to discover that. So, um, I, but yeah, I, I guess that's what makes Chromacon special because we're like 
because I'm I'm personally I feel, personally feel at, at least um, part of what makes it special is that we don't try to um, represent our exhibitors in 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 the sense that you know we market the event as a certain you know genre or like style you know um, it's really about communicating that you know whatever you see is made by the person standing in front of you and mm. uh, they are the ones that are embodying like whatever their work is you know should be about so right. um, to that effect you know we're very open to um, exhibitors you know um, what, whatever medium and genre they might be working in now you're also a game developer and um, <laughs> how did you get into that from like being you know from art perspective and then moving on to game development because that's something that interests me quite a bit. And recently, um, especially with lockdown and um, trying to, um, you know, trying to have some uh, away time from the stress and whatever's going on politically and whatever. And then you can just sit down and just play games and enjoy that. Now, excuse me. You came up with a unique game a while ago. You were talk talking way back in 20 2018 to me. Is that something that you carried on, or is that finished, or where is that with that one? And how'd you get into it? Sorry, too many questions there, but uh, how'd you get into it? Well, I've always, you... yeah, I yeah. mean, I always, I have a lot of different interests, right? So, um, I think mm. as a creator, like, it's not, um, I mean, I guess like, you, you can see it sort of being reflected in, in Chromacon, right? Um, yeah. we have independent game developers at Chromacon too, and I think, mm -hmm. um, like, personally for me, like, I'm there's a couple of things that interest me. You know, it's it's like you know storytelling. Like I'm, I really love storytelling, whether it's you know in a, one piece of illustration or uh, you know a comic or a game. Um, so there's a lot of commonalities between you know how um, like why it interests me because uh, sometimes a, a a certain narrative or experience um, fits a medium more than another, and I might I, I'll you know, I'm motivated to, to pursue that you know. Um, that in it, you know, expressing myself in a different medium. Um, but going back to your question, um, I'm not sure which <laughs> which game you were mentioning. But I, I uh, did, did you, are you mean are you referring to Golden Threads or um, the one that? I think that it was. Uh, you talking about how um, there was a game you're developing about um, gold diggers, right? Um, oh, yeah. So um, so in 2016. Or seventeen, <laughs> I don't remember my memories. Time's going too fast. Um, so, Auckland uh, Museum uh, had a exhibition, sort of, um, showcase like sort of documenting the hundred seventy five years of Chinese migrants' history in New mm. Zealand. Um, and obviously, a lot of that is like gold mining history. And yeah. uh, so, myself and a New Zealand playwright writer Renee Lang, uh, we collaborated to make a um, interactive narrative game um, called Golden Threads. Um, so that was a collaboration between us and the museum for that exhibition. Um, but the subject matter, in, you know, fascinates me. So I'm motivated. <laughs> it's definitely one of the projects um, I've always have like on my um, palette, if you to 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 continue developing. So that's golden threads, like in a uh, rope or string. Yeah, yeah, like threads, and as well as like you know narrative threads, because you, you it's like a um, the the game we made for um, the museum was a choose your own adventure, right? So you can nice. choose. Um, uh, so essentially, the idea was uh, you 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 find like a lost diary, and you read the like life life story of some um, of a of a Chinese migrant in the early nineteenth century to New Zealand, mm. um, and you make life choices and. Uh, you reach endings, and uh, some of the good endings, shall we say, would tell you like, "Oh, you lived the life of this person," and then you actually discover, "Oh, it's uh, it's actually info like you know, you it's actually um, very non-fictional in, in the sense that it's like based on like hit actual history," and mm. uh, and obviously that works really well for the uh, exhibition because then you can find out more about um, the, the 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 I was want to say character, but it's actually like you know the person you um, life journey you just experienced, you know, yeah. um, so. Yeah, that, I mean, I grew up play, playing like uh, like Magic School Bus and like Winter World Come in San Diego and stuff. There used to be like, you know, games at school um, that mm. I felt were quite, quite awesome, you know, like in terms of teaching um, kids about the world, you know. So I'd uh, mm. love to work on something like that. So this is like, a, it sounds to me like it's a visual novel. Is that what it, what that was? Uh, yeah, that's sort of oh, a, that job. Yeah, it, I mean, yeah, more, more or less. Yeah, um, I'm addicted to it. Yeah, I'm addicted to visual novels at the moment. I'm trying to wean myself <laughs> off. It's really hard. 
because the, the cool thing about visual novels is, like you said, you pick your own path, right? You get to you get to make choices for that uh, for that person you're playing, you know, the main character you're playing, and you get to decide which uh, thread, you know, or which uh, way you want to go with it, which narrative you want to follow. And being a writer and you being an you know, you kind of, it's like, um, it's just another facet moving on from being uh, either a comic book artist or a, uh, sorry, writer or a film writer or um, what's the other one? A novelist, right? So, and you're trying to bring them all together into a visual forum like game um independent game development with visual novels it's such an interesting thing i found it, it was so um for me i found it so captivating that why wasn't i into this earlier on how did i not know to get into it so i think it's a really great medium and i've been talking about it on stream quite a few times about how much i love it and also looking at writing about for it so with golden threads um how far did you go with it? Was it like, did you go, um, because it was part of the museum though, did you end up like being able to like, um, you know, did the museum use it to send it overseas to showcase, you know, um, with the uh, with, uh, ancestry of, um, you know, um, Chinese uh, uh, migrants or immigrants in New Zealand and show them around? Because I remember you telling me that people in, even in China weren't aware that they were way back when, that they were Chinese, in, you know, in New Zealand and, and so, yeah. how did yeah, how did um, it go? Well, uh, so I personally, um, as part of a Chrome Code initiative, mm -hmm. um, because we've done a few art exchanges in Asia. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2000 and, oh, so this was 2017, actually. You're right. Um, so, uh, so uh, yeah, so the exhibition was like early 2017. Like it started, I think, in the 2016. So like, that's why I'm getting confused because it's just like Christmas break mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, but end of 2017, um, we went on exchange tour to China. Um, so one of the stops was um, we play games at expo in Shanghai. Um, mm. So we had a booth showcasing a number of independent games, and also you know I brought Golden Threads with me, and um, and we also went to Chengdu uh, de uh, Design Week as well. After that, so we had there was two sh um, shows that we um, you know demoed um, the game at. And uh, yeah, like <laughs> got a really good response. I mean, despite the fact that there wasn't the context of the exhibition alongside it, but um, I think yeah, you know, well, I, I, I indeed I did mention to you. Um, I think a lot of um, like, especially like people you know my my age or even younger, like you know, um, kids mm -hmm. in China, um, who might be gamers, but they are very unfamiliar with like. Uh, you know, migrant history of that that period. Yeah. Um, the most, you know, when you mention gold mining, they'll probably think of San Francisco, you know, because that's the most famous, you know, gold rush, um, gold sort of West. Chinatown, and yeah, all of that. So um, this is this is lost history, you know, because essentially when people think about New Zealand, they think of um, more modern migration uh, migrants. Um, even like like you know, when I migrated, it was like with my family it was ninety seven. So um, I would say this is like you know, I'm on the crust of like what people think about in terms of like oh you know Chinese in New Zealand. Um, but you know, there's a lot of um, like cultural heritage in New Zealand um, from mm -hmm. you know like third or fourth generation um, Chinese. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was, it's fascinating talking to them about it because um, you know it's stuff that I learned as I was working on this project as well. Right? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I def, uh I think the actual exhibition um has been toured. So it's it it's gone down to Wellington once. Uh, I don't know if it's still there, the National Portrait Gallery, I believe. Um but we haven't showcased the the game um publicly since. Um uh, which is <laughs> I, I think I love for it to be out there, you know. I mean it is uh, I put it on yeah. the online so you can definitely play it. Um yeah. but yeah, personally I've been, you know, working on hoping to make like a full-fledged um sort of standalone title um mm -hmm. in this uh you know based on this history but the thing is like i i, I you know because i'm also learning about the history as well so it's, it's quite important mm -hmm. to me in terms of um, the research so you know like last year i went to um the china um the the, the history museum in in chinatown in san fran mm -hmm. um and uh you know i got got in touch some with some of the scholars you know who's who work on that you know museum and uh yeah so i, I personally you know i feel like do, need to do a bit more research as well um and also just find a line between you know like um i guess you know edutainment if that's a, you know that's a term people say you know yeah. um in terms of like being accessible for for kids you know um because yeah. you don't want to be just be like hey you know read this book um because that's mm -hmm. sort of you know that i think that would be the the um the strength of you know a medium like a game 
you know, and, and the interactivity, right? So, um, so it, it interests me from a um, design standpoint as well as you know the, the historical you know standpoint mm -hmm. as well. I um it the thing is um uh, the diaspora like the, with the like it's quite similar to the um, Chinese uh, diaspora and um the Indian diaspora right big huge mainland countries and then everybody uh, at the early stages of like eighteen hundreds um eighteen sixties I think uh, around that time I know with Fiji it was around about eighteen eight um eighteen sixties where everybody was moving around after the uh, after slavery had ended so everyone was like we need we need uh, we need workers we need workers and so i i had my own sort of um awakening back in 2005 you know i did my five-year research after finding out um, learning about fiji hey i thought indians were always in fiji and saying so it's like mm. actually no <laughs> no and it's like oh there is people from you know, Mauritius here, uh, you know, they're from Sri Lanka and, you know, from uh, Pakistan. And it's like, and they're from China and Malaysia. And it's like, I thought it was just everybody was here, you know, all the time. And suddenly, like, it's eye-opening. And you're, you're right about the whole idea of um, if it's educational and if it's fun, you know. And it's kind of interesting because I was like, I decided, well, you know, I'll do a graphic novel, but I would fictionalize the story so it's like hey all the little things are in there but it's actually entertaining and it's actually fun it's a love story and all this and so you actually enjoy it rather than just going this guy's just trying to reject me all day long i'm not reading that the other thing is um with the graphic work did you utilize like um you know you work with a, a museum did you utilize like still images from that historic period or did you um, design, uh, you know, literally design or um, graphic design images yourself, or did you mix and match? Uh, it, it, there was a lot of reference because because the exhibition was actually like a photo photographic um, mm -hmm. exhibition. Um, so uh, the you know the historical figures that we actually based on some of the story threads, you know, mm -hmm. um, with our people featured in the exhibition and there's photographic uh, like photography of them uh, which is why i said you know they're, they're the good endings because you know you, you probably <laughs> you know it's unlikely you'll be recorded in history if you didn't actually um benefit from you know the migration experience unfortunately you know there's not a it's not an easy you know thing being a gold miner in that period right mm -hmm. um so uh i think we were quite truthful in that sense i did a lot of research myself obviously as well and um uh, um there's a lot of scholars who contributed a lot to you know to the to the field so um so that's that was definitely helpful yeah um but yeah i painted the um illustrations based on you know a mix of um what was featured in the exhibition as well as um research i did myself uh, along with wow. my renee Glenn. how many images did you did you um yeah did you create yourself uh, i think i think it was like around 40 or 50 um because we had a lot of story branching choices mm. um and bear in mind you know yeah. i would have loved to do more i mean and we were quite ambitious but we only had about i think we were we, we made this in about like two months mm. um or less um so yeah it was uh <laughs> quite a rushed process in that sense yeah, but i was know. thinking that that's quite like um uh, how long was the gameplay because i mean two months isn't that long because uh, some of the games i'm playing it's like you get um you know, you get a release once a month, and it's only probably about half an hour of gameplay. Uh, how long was your guys' gameplay? Um, I suppose, I mean, it depends on kind of how fast you read. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think a typical story thread would be about, like, um, three to five minutes, I think. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of different paths you could go down. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the motivation, right? We, we Because we made it for the exhibition, you know, we didn't want people mm -hmm. to... Um, what the idea was, you know, you, you, you would... Uh, reach an ending and find out more about the person because it was like you know a section of the exhibition of the exhibition dedicated to them. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I, I think in terms of like working on a standalone um, game like that I have in mind, um, the game design would be very different. Did you um, did you get a, like a funding? I mean, of course, you work with the museum, but like for actual research into it, did you get funding for that? Uh, well, for this project in, partic in particular, it was the Auckland Museum had reached out to 
um, uh, uh, Chinese uh, arts practitioners for proposals um, to basically create some new projects to go alongside the exhibition. Um, so that's how we worked on the project together. Me and Renee, we submitted a pitch um, to make Golden Threads. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know if that's a common thing. Uh, I would hope so, um, you know, because um, it's not, it, it, I think it was a good way to go about it because it's not very speculative in that sense, right? Um, mm. We only worked on it once the museum had agreed that, you know, um, they felt the, the proposal fitted alongside the exhibition. Um, and obviously they were very, um, you know, careful about the historical accuracy and everything. So, yeah. um, so in, in, you know, in that sense, it was very good to work with them on that because, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, they could help us um, consider some of the, uh, you know, we, we you know, there's a lot of things that, that we don't really usually think about, but, you know, mm -hmm. um, we had, uh, you know, we were thinking about like whether it should be in uh, traditional or simplified Chinese. Um, mm -hmm. And we were thinking about how, because um, they were, you know, uh, living um, descendants of the yeah. people featured in the book. So there's a lot of things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, it was good to work with the museum on that, obviously. Yeah, I wonder, like, I mean, because it'll be easier for the um, for the younger generation and even doesn't even have to be Asian to want to play, get, you know, learn about the history of that. But by making it, I guess, um, simplify, it would be easier to be more, um, what is it, accessible you know mm. to everybody more than that it's like it's like like uh indians from india speak a different dialect to everybody else outside of india that we speak and it's like that doesn't even sound like hindi what is that you're speaking and you know and we've kind of like pigeonized the whole way we speak and we can we can speak to people from canada and hindi and understand them but we can't speak to people from india and understand them so uh did you simplify it enough to not break with tradition or that they were happy, you know, the relatives were happy that, hey, you know, we, we understand where you're coming from with this or did you have to stick to a format? Um, well, the thing is we did a lot of research was based on um, uh, like a really good series of books by um, Professor James Ng um, called Windows on the Chinese Past and was, you know, extensively researched alongside, you know, the descendants of um, the gold miners. So that was super helpful in the sense that like we didn't have to kind of make up anything like much you know along the way um uh you know all the i guess some of the fictional stuff really came from us looking at what was a common um uh like you know state of a like a life experience of a you know gold miner um mm -hmm. and that that was i guess you know sort of the uh like bad endings you might you might you know you might find um I think the only one, like the for example, the only portrait I um, painted, like essentially from imagination, was um, actually one that wasn't featured um, in the uh, exhibition. But Renee and I, you know, we decided together that was important for us to feature this um, person called mm. um, Joe Kam Young, um, who was. Um, yeah, he was who he he was murdered by um um uh, like in the early 19th century uh as in the as a, uh, early 20th century in nine, it's like 1905 or something um as in a, in, in a hate crime um so there wasn't any historical um photos of him because he was like a homeless man um that was like yeah. shot dead um on Haining Street um mm. and so all the historical documents actually are of like the murderer because it was like right. quite a controversial thing at the time. And um, I think the murderer actually ended up like escaping, you know, prison like seven times or something because um, mm -hmm. there was a lot of uh, public support for for him at the time. Because, um, yeah. you know, there was like a yellow pearl, like, you know, all this yeah. racist things going on. Um, so unfortunately, like this, the, the actual victim was sort of lost to history, you know? Yeah. Um, so even though he wasn't featured in the exhibition, we felt, um, like we really wanted to have him as part of the um uh you know the the game just to you know mm. to teach that part of history so that was the only time like i actually painted you know a person um from imagination because there was no mm. document 
Um, so, um, did you like? It's interesting, like um, trying to um, you know trying to paint someone who you know the story about. But how did was it tough trying to like visualize him from like your imagination and all the stories around it to actual one through two? You know, did you do? Was it by um, um, was it freehand or was it digital? That this work you did for this one? Um, I painted all the illustrations for Golden Threads digitally because, um, like I said, just at the time the time constraint was quite. Mm. Um, you're quite tight and uh also like because I, I i like program the the game as well so um i was trying to like you know i had to do both basically so um it'd be interesting i think to to work traditionally as well you know um mm. if i had more time did you like um so you you said there was um professor james ing is that ing uh it's ng Sorry. ng right no right okay so let me just fix that and also I'm going to ask you the name of the book again, uh, the series of books there. So, uh, you know, if somebody wants to check it out, they, they're able to. So it's um, uh, let me see. It's called Windows on the Chinese Past. Windows on the... Yeah, on a Chinese Past. On a Chinese Past. Yeah. Excellent. It, it's amazing. Uh, I mean, I want, I want to buy a copy because I bought a Renee's copy. Um, like, because I think it's, um, I think it's no longer, like, in print. Um, mm. But you can probably find it in your public library. Um, yeah. It's, it's interesting um, that, like, you know, there's so much um, research. One of the things, like, I, I, what I like is that you actually put in someone that, like, I don't like, I don't like the way people like to hide past things that happened that are bad, right? Because it just means that, um, because when you see it then you can actually um when you learn about it then you can see it then you can go man you know that wasn't all right you know that wasn't that was then and it wasn't good so let's make sure that it doesn't happen again whereas people go well you know it was then we don't worry yeah it's just in the past and i think hiding things doesn't work and help anybody i, I found that with uh, when i was learning about fiji and learning about um, what was hap what happened in the 35 years of the indentured laborship that was basically like kind of like slavery <laughs> for the Indians. And I was like, man, you know, and but they hit it for, you know, so a lot of people just hit it. They don't want to talk about it. And so we grew up a generation without knowing anything about it. And then later on going, why aren't you all mad? Because, well, it's because it happened. And, you know, we're here and, you know, we, we've got to, we're going to try to be better and, you know, and so on. I think the great thing about it um, when, when we, you know, like artists like yourself and myself and others you know, that look into actually doing creative works, right? Um, like doing visual work, creative works, making accessible, making history accessible where it's not only um, entertaining, but educational, but also interactive. The whole idea of, you know, being able to hold up a book in your hand that's colorful, that's, uh, you know, that's got pictures that you can say well you know give it to anybody and they'll be able to pick it up and read and then you got gamers who are into gaming and they're like they'll never want to pick up a book but they might try to game and i think the idea of being able to um you know to do something like chromacon and adding the gaming aspect to it and that's kind of uh interesting because that's something that we've been talking about ourselves with plunge is that you know why don't we um because i'm so excited you know this one like three four months now they've been really interested in the gaming side of things especially with the visual narrative thing you know not like the whole uh shoo shoo bang bang you know kind of thing or you know other you know trying to um going to different planets and stuff but actually tell the whole interactive side of things where you can actually go down different pathways because i i like the um it reminds me of uh pick a path box way back when I was when I was a kid right you know back um, back in the 80s for us I'm not sure if you guys if you had it around when you came over uh, because I don't you know I wasn't around in the 90s yeah, that's, that's, I mean that's basically what Golden Trace is <laughs> so yeah, yeah so definitely. you get to choose which way you want to go and it's like it's just you know unlike comic books it's just a complete narrative right from A to Z it's there Whereas with, with um, visual uh, novels and light novels, I think it's a, I always get confused whether it's the same thing or not. But visual um, novels, um, that whole actually uh, the um, the game developer or the writer and the artist, they actually allow you to choose 
different ways. And I think that's also allowing the, um, the player to have control over things. Of course, the you know the um, the creators making sure that you know it weaves in the way he wants to go. But at least you have a way of different choices and multiple endings, like you did with Golden Threads. And I think the the multiple endings is quite interesting. Did you? Was it tough trying to tie it all together? Because um, some of the ones I've read, you know, played, it's like uh, you kind of go, well, how is this all going to tie in? This guy is going all over the place. And, you know, was it hard trying to write it in a way that you could actually say, this is the end result. Now, here's, you know, here's my yellow sticker here. And he's going to go there and that. How hard was it as a writer? Um. Well, for this project, Renee was the writer. So um, I think between me and her, we were mainly discussing because um, I was more familiar with, I guess, you know, like the, the format of um, interactive narratives. And um, but obviously I had a lot of faith in Renee to do the writing because she has um, quite extensive knowledge in this this area already in terms of like the historical accuracy side of things because she's done a few um, plays on um, you know, on this period um, already. So um, I think more than anything, um, well, first of all, you know, like choosing this um, genre, if you will, um, is, it, you know, it's a conscious decision, not because it, you know, um, it is re you know, relatively easier to develop, but more um, because, like I said, uh, the, the the system of um, interactivity, you know, that um, something like a choose your own adventure or pick a path. Um, is uh, like there are benefits to to choosing that. Um, first of all, like I mentioned, you know, we we designed it as such that you will reach a conclusion where um, well, the good endings, um, which is like a reward, right? And um, uh, the good endings feature like actual historical um, information, and then uh, we even outside the context of the, of the exhibition, you know, we have links to um, further information you can read. So it's almost you know like a um, way to ease people into be interested in the subject matter, um, and the other thing is, you know, the, you know um, there's, there's a few techniques we will adopt, right? So, for example, um, uh, you know, the, we don't really mention gender or, or anything like in the beginning because the, the idea is like, you know, oh, first of all, you know, like no one writes in a diary about like, oh, like what their gender is, you know, unless that's <laughs> something they're going through, you know. So, like, yeah. it's placed to the actual like meta narrative or like context of the, you know, the mm. the, the, the world. The world that we're building so yeah. um, as you read it you understand like okay this is a diary and oh like it's um uh that you know and then you find out like who the diary is like um so like th all those are conscious decisions right um so i think those are the little um i guess, I guess going to the broader like you know discussion around like why you'll make a game or why um so also in a way, like you know, why we we would be the ones working on this is because you know I think we, um, you know, even when we pitched this idea to the museum, it was um, because you know first of all we were confident that we would be able to do enough research to to do this well and do it truthfully, um, and also because you know like this, like I said, this um, uh, this the, the, this format is is um, something that we thought about and we we knew that would be really good to communicate um the end goal which is you know to teach people about um history and uh hopefully get them to you know step in the shoes of someone um you know who was in this period and uh there's multiple ways of doing this right so putting on an exhibition a photographic ex exhibition is one way you know um you know making a documentary making a film is one way so this is just, just happens to be another way of communicating that Was it um, tough sticking to a sh um, schedule because you had the two months and they, the day, um, did you have to have it ready or the day say, we're going we're gonna to have this exhibition starting on this day, you have to get it ready by this day and we're ready to go. Was it, uh, you know, was it tough trying to stick to a schedule, especially I know with game development, you're like tweaking, tweaking, tweaking and, you know, you got to get people in there to beta test it and stuff. And I think it's, you know, a, it's, it's a good motivation, you know, because um, mm. like even when I work on my personal projects, hence why I guess the actual standalone game is not out, you know, because you, 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 if you're perfectionist, you'll always keep working on it because um, mm. there's no, you set your own deadlines, right? Whereas, yeah. you know, something like Chromicon, because I announced the dates, like I just have to do it. 
um, or something like this. It's because there's an actual exhibition opening and we just have to finish it by that day, you know? Um, so um, in a way, that's like a really good motivation to get to get it done, you know? And um, I, I think without like projects like this, I can't, I, I, I would feel like a hack calling myself a developer because, you know, like, oh, I think all the ones, all the, all the experience games um, that mm. I finished are, you know, um, you know, something like this or um, like there was a game jam game I made earlier this year and I was, you know, because it was for game jam and, you know, we had one week to make it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, it, it's hard, but also it actually makes you finish something. So, <laughs> you, you know how it is. Yeah. Deadlines are, <laughs> are great, especially if they're set by someone else that so you just have to like, you know, do it or you'll disappoint now, people. Getting back to Chromacon, how how many people have you got on your team who's, you know, to organize how you guys run things and, um, you know, because it's getting, it's gotten bigger and bigger, right? Remember, you, you said you came out in what, 2013 with a haul. How big was the haul compared to where you are now? Um, so we didn't actually do a haul. Uh, so like, you know, I, I didn't finish my story, sorry. So we, we had a whole book. And then yep. after Christmas, um, the word the word spread. So and you know we ended up with like 50, 60 artists. Um, mm. but we, I think the final number was like 60, 65 artists the first year. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I was very naive at the time. Um, so I just I just called up Altia Center, um, which is you know in town in um, Auckland, and yeah. um, uh, so our first year we booked one of the floors, the Eng Zen for you. Um, so ever since then, we've it kind of consistently grown in the sense that, you know, the second festival was, um, across, uh, two floors. Mm. Yeah. So we basically just consistently took over more, more of the building. So last year we had about 200 plus, um, I think about 220 almost exhibitors and, uh, that was mm. three floors. Um, we also mm. had the top floor. You know, that of, that we had first year for our art awards. So, yeah. you know, if we go by this rate, you know, we'll probably just take over the whole building next time. So, so you guys hold it at the RTA Center itself? Yeah, RTA Center. It's always, it's always been at the RTA Center. Oh, sorry, I forgot to answer your question. Um, we, our core team is like, um, we have a core team of about basically three people. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there's other like, uh, you know, uh, like Cornelius, who does all of our design, our graphic design work, um, and we, you know, we commission an artist um, to do our festival art every year, and you know a bunch of other um, like talented folks helping us out, of course. And then obviously on the day of the festival, there's all of um, volunteers. So yeah, um, yeah. excellent. Um, so is it free to get in, or is there a pay payment to get in? Because I know hiring something like the Art Center is not going to be cheap, right? So is it like, um, is, do you cover the costs by uh, vendors, uh, sorry, exhibitors, or by door charge? Uh, neither, really. <laughs> um, like, so the festival is free. It's always been free um, for cool. anyone to attend. Cool. Um, and I guess the idea was, um, you know, just looking at, like, exhibition opening, again, versus, um, like, pop culture ex expo. Um, yeah. I think there's... There's a reason why there's a door charge to Pop Culture Expos because they're offering yeah. you know, a entertainment and they're delivering an wow. entertainment experience. Um, whereas I think what we're offering is quite new for a lot of people in the wider community. And um, so I just wanted to see if we can do it and make it accessible as possible. Um, so the more and more people can understand like, you know, uh, what actually is happening in, you know, yeah. out in New Zealand. Um, so it's, that's always been, it's always been free to, you know, to visit. Um, in terms of exhibiting, yeah, we have a, um, there is a vendor cost, um, right. but it all really goes towards <clears throat> hiring, um, you know, display panels and furniture. And, um, yeah. you know, we print, we make an art book every year. So, you know, they get a copy of the art book. Um, so once you actually add all of that up, it really is, it's kind of subsidized really, you know, um, we fund the festival, like, you know, through other, um, other ways it's, yeah. It's pretty cool. I mean, I think uh, going from about uh, 65 to 200, uh, you know, in four years, such, especially when you um, only do it every second year. Uh, and and a lot of the fact that you've established now, uh, has it been like, one of the things I've noticed is that there's so many uh, events in Auckland 
that are, you know, convention wise, you've got um, the anime con that happens, um, overload, you've got um, in October, not sure it's still happening, but next um, next month, you know, you've got um, I'm again, Pop Culture Expo. And do you think, um, how has it been? Because I know that's what one thing I've noticed is that it's the three that are there, the key ones, you've got Overload, you've got, um, you've got um, yourselves with Chromacon, and then you've got um, Expo. Both of those two go on every year, and yet you guys come in every second year. Have you um, kind of, um, obviously uh, with the vendors you've, and uh, exhibitors, it's grown, but have you noticed any change in like attendances, uh, attendances because of uh, you know, not doing it every year? I mean, there's definitely pros and cons. Um, I think we have very different business models to, you know, the other expos. So uh, for me, it's not a, um, it, it, it really is a passion project. You know, it's not um, like a business <laughs> initiative for me. So yeah. I don't I don't have to do it every year, you know, because it's like hurts my bottom line or something. You know, if anything, um, I'd probably be better for my income if I don't like do <laughs> Chrome Gun. Um, because you know I take so much time out to work on it. But um um in terms of attendees, I don't really think so because the community, like I have faith in the community in terms of like what artists are creating. And um I have feedback from artists who are saying like, oh, you know, having two years to work like to really work on something um is really good. Um versus you know if we on every year it sort of becomes like a arts market situation where you just constantly you're just thinking of like okay i'm just gonna make some merch uh, which is nothing, yeah. nothing wrong with that obviously yeah uh, but i think you know i would at least like to think that you know having it every two years gives people like a really good deadline in the sense that like, mm. i can really work on something um um i mean att attendees are very consistent uh mm. we I think I, my, my goal last year was to try and break the 10,000 um, mm -hmm. at the attendees barrier, but we, I think we were close to 12,000. Um, wow. So it's a very steady curve. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in terms of, because, because I think, you know, we, we communicate our festival very differently. You know, like I said, this, we, this, it, it, it would be a lot easier if I just, you know, market it as like, hey, there's fantasy, there's sci-fi or something, you know, people, things that people were very familiar with. Um, yeah. But then, you know, it like I said, you know, it attaches like a certain stigma to I'm not stigma, it's, it's like a, almost like a like extra baggage, right? Because what if you don't work in those genres and you feel like okay, um, yeah. then you know I'm starting to be represented by you know in the, like Chromacon in a different way, um, just yeah. like maybe if you go to a certain exhibition that just it's very focused on pop culture or um, certain fandoms, you feel pressured into creating you know fan art or something that to like to fulfill what the audience wants right um which is fair yeah. enough because that's what they paid to experience so you can't really you know um yeah. be annoyed at that that people people want that um so yeah i think if there's a way for us to do it every year um that's sustainable like we would move into that um we just haven't quite found it yet because you know like i mentioned um it doesn't we're not the, the festival was not really funded by the artists um you know mm. their their booth costs um if anything like i'm very familiar with like how much people pay for a booth you know at other events and um, yeah yeah so like if anything we would want to like subsidize or, like to make it accessible as possible because i don't want mm. that to be a barrier for for artists especially young artists as well right um so yeah it's at the moment it's the it's sort of what works for us but um yeah. Yeah, which I mean, which is a plus because it makes you, you've got um you know you know what you want and you know what your uh, what your vendors or uh, exhibitors are looking to do what the artists are wanting, and they're aware of it that hey it's going to happen in two years, let's you know get the get out of gear and get ready for in two years here's my you know, we can carry on doing other stuff keep going to the do the, uh, what is it called um you know nine to five but come home and slowly keep working and building up that portfolio to sell again. And the other thing, I think that's the thing about having something like that. And you're right about um, when you're going to expos and stuff like that, and you and you're um, stuck in a genre, say, and you've got to do the fan art because that's what people go there for. They want their latest uh, Rick and Morty, right? <laughs> um, poster, and, and uh, can you do a Rick and Morty? And this is what's going to sell this year. 
And then next year, it's like, oh, it's going to be such and such. And you've got to make sure you've got about 20 of those different styles ready for that. Whereas when you come to something like Chromacone, the artist is choosing what they want to put out because they have the freedom to put out what they, you know, what they want to show the what they want to show the audience. How has been the reception to that from the audience members or the attendees? You know, seeing all these different varieties of work coming out. Mm, I think we've got a really good. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, like there are things that are popular and people, you know, want those things. Right, but yeah. um, I, you know, like I said, it's a conscious decision in terms of how we market the event and we com how we communicate. And you know, we have a curation process as well, um, mm -hmm. and uh, for for artists exhibiting. And uh, you know, often I think a lot of people feel like it's such a waste of time because you know they might have exhibited through you know three times in the past already. So like, why why having to go through this again? Um, but for me, it like all these things add up in terms of you know for me because I think it's it's important for us to build like a. Um, Ideally, you know, we work towards like a cultural shift in New Zealand, so that you know, like the the average um, person who might not be familiar with what New Zealand artists are making, they can slowly understand, like, you know, this is a thing in New Zealand. Like, we have a lot of artists creating like interesting work, right? Because mm -hmm. um, the problem, the alternative is, you know, like the average Joe knows about Lord of the Rings, but they don't know about any of the artists working on Lord of the Rings, and maybe they have their own ideas, wow. so they'll never be yeah. able to have a chance to actually like, you know break out there unless you know it's like it's like Ta taika he's so talented but it wasn't until he made you know a, a thor movie that everyone's like oh well um yeah. so that's that's i think we need a cultural shift you know and um so it's all these things like this seems like we're adding barriers but actually it's a from, i think it's like a support network right and i but yeah. we, we definitely have good feedback from um attendees you know because the first year i definitely saw that a lot of attendees like you know they were really happy um you know uh, with the event, but the feedback, a lot of it was just, just kind of like, almost like, like shock, you know, surprise that like, oh, wow, there's so many artists in New Zealand working on this. I mean, yeah. even though they were there all like, you know, um, they're always been there, you know? <laughs> um, and, uh, but over the, t over, over time, I've definitely seen um, the feedback change. And, you know, that, that's what I was saying. I think it, it helps to motivate artists to make, um, you know, to, to work on more ambitious and innovative things because um, the, the attendees understand, like we've already gotten over that hurdle of when you come to Chrome Con, like, what is it, you know? Um, they understand, you know, they're, they're seeing and um, purchasing and collecting things made by the person standing in front of them. So um, we've got good feedback on, you know, like people, people who might have, it's more nuanced feedback in terms of like, oh, this artist I've been following for ages. It's amazing to see like all this new work from them, or mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting. It's it's amazing to see like new like styles emerge that I was not familiar with, and um, so that you know they might come for one person or one type of work, but they they get to experience like a whole range of works, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, that's I think the most like unique thing about Chromacon. It's it's. That's pretty unique, and you're right because it. When you go to, you know, um, I think a lot of times, like um, because we're not really a uh, a art focused nation as such, even though this, we're filled with artists and creatives and all that, there's not so much art focused as it, you know. But now it seems to be like there's been a, a real, real cool push uh, towards actually. Um, seeing more of what's going on, especially in the graphic arts and the game development. And actually people come to accept that there is a market. And not only that, when people see money being made, right, for these specific areas and they go, well, that, well now we need to get behind this. You know, it's like we need to get behind New Zealand Film because there's money being made, you know. Uh, and one of the things is um, that you guys put out uh, an art book each, each time. So... One what, what of the questions I wanted to ask that, about that was that um, how big is it and is it a pre-order or do you um, are you able to buy it afterwards? Say so like, say I missed out last year, Can I? is it still available? Do you have reference or I, you know, is there boxes sitting around that you can say, hey, you know, can I get one of these around or is it on the website? Um, are they yeah, available? I mean, uh, it, it's uh, well, well part, first of all, partly it, it goes towards like um, rewarding uh, folks who support our Kickstarter campaign to fund the right. festival, right? Um, 
but yeah, we obviously have it at the festival as a memorabilia. Um, and you know, the artists, you know, they get one. Um, and uh, yeah, we uh, we still have it for sale afterwards. Uh, we have a um, dedicated website called Chroma. Dot NZ. Mm. Um, that's where we have a lot of our festival merch, and um, and you know, I, we we take it overseas as well. You know, we tour and do exchanges. Um, and you know we try to get into like public libraries and things like that. So I think there's a we get a lot of mileage out of the art book, you know, because uh, they're just putting the you know, like you know um, the work and the artists you know into the into the public space. And uh, yeah, it's it's a really great thing. You know, whenever I go overseas, and you know, it's like a so passport for you to you know just yeah. Well, that's pretty cool as well, isn't it? Like you being able to give give out something that's been created locally. Especially when people don't aren't aware of the talent that is the talent pool that is in New Zealand, especially mm -hmm. in the creatives. I mean, um, especially around graphic arts, right? Especially around graphic arts and uh, graphic illustrations and comics and stuff, and the quality of work. People aren't aware that there's so many talented um, people in New Zealand uh, who they might not have heard of, but are making a big overseas, you know, and um, and then to. Uh, be able to meet them and say like Chroma or you know other expos and go. What are you doing? Why are you sitting with these big guys here? Ah, it's because such and such is like. Where are you from? You know, and kind of thing. I think we. It's it's really weird. Um, there's this there is this really. Um, I mean, I haven't been to Chroma. I just haven't been able to because it's every second year, and I don't know. I've always looked at being there, but I don't travel outside of Fungray that much because of my health. So, I, you know, I, it's just been that way. But I've always wanted to be there because I look at all the pictures and I go, you know, this that looks really cool. I got to get there. And so, having to see such amazing work on display, it always um, blows me away because the acceptance. Uh, you know, saying 12,000 people came out, right? Just for New Zealand artists. Compared to, say, you know, you go to Expo and there's like hardly anybody there for this artist, you know? But now you go to Chroma, you got 12,000 people for New Zealand artists and New Zealand uh, uh, developers, you know, creatives. That is an amazing feat to uh, put uh, local creatives in front of people's eyes, 12,000 people's eyes. And uh, because, you know, it's just, it just um, blows me away, you know, that you've only put it out what this year, next year's going to be a fifth year and the, um, the way you've grown. And I think it's just the hard work, really. I mean, you know, I can, you know, you, okay, so you've got three key people, but I mean, you've got tons of volunteers behind the scene we don't see or hear about until, you know, because things, how many floor levels are there out here that you guys cover? Um, last year was three fours. Yeah, and that's that's uh, people have got to make the run smoothly. Partitions, building all together. The other thing you mentioned about that was that you had. A, a, do you do like an opening night? Uh, yeah. So we have we we have um, hmm, how many days would you really count for it? So um, we have a night that's just for the artists. You know, so that's the setup day, and um. Uh, and I guess you know that evening is really just for the artists to mingle because you know that's really feedback from them, um, saying that they get so busy like during the actual mm -hmm. over the actual weekend they don't even have time to like um, connect with other artists. Um, yeah. So that's one, I guess you know, that's one con that comes out of like the then having more attendees, right? Um, so we do have something like that, and um, yeah, we've you know we have a lot of satellite events, right? So um, we we do. Um, we collaborate with like libraries in Auckland to host mm. um, sort of artists like working in libraries um, leading yeah. up to the festival. Um, so you can go and actually meet artists that like local mm. to where you are and they're based locally. Um, and you know we run a uh, Chroma Connect, which is a um, like an industry education event as well alongside mm. the festival. And then we have like workshops and master classes and things like that. Um, yeah. and, you know, we run talks during the festival. So I guess technically it's these four floors because we have you know a room for talks. <laughs> yeah, have a lot of lot, um, lot of things going on. Yeah, from the the wars, you know, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of um, you know. I think we, you know, it, it is because it's every two years. We want to make it worth it, right? Um, yeah. And uh, the, like I think you were talking about the twelve thousand figure. Um, for me, you know, it's a, it's a really good motivation because you know, um, even though 
in the grand scheme of things, it might not seem so big. Um, because like I say, if you compare to Expo here or even like overseas. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, I think if you think about like what the population of New Zealand is, um, like you know, it, I, I have no doubt that if this Chronicle was like in a larger city, um, mm -hmm. you know, for like potential sponsors or what have you, you know, it'll make a bigger impact for them. But we'll yeah. get there eventually, you know, because um, mm -hmm. like it, it's sort of you know, it's it's the problem that um, independent artists face as well. Uh, yeah, in the sense that you know they're they're building a niche audience, um, mm -hmm. and if they were in a you know, if they're in the States or, you know, in Asia, or, you know, like they will, they will actually be able to um, prove their worth like a little bit faster because a niche audience still is a couple hundred thousand people, you know, hundreds yeah. of thousand people maybe. Um, but yeah. you, know, you start so small that um, like it's hard for people to take you seriously. And I think at the point I, I wanted to make, which was um, that's what we emphasize so much on the independent part of it um, because I think it's quite important for there to be a bit more nuance and just awareness of like what makes you know a, a piece of work good you know like in, in terms of um not because it's a certain genre or certain medium um because like i mentioned you know there's certain stigma that gets ended up attached to it right so like you know so even comics because you know like i guess like superhero comics and things like that has it's so like it's so much dominance in the public sphere that you you know some people some some artists maybe they choose to say like oh I'm a graphic novelist or something just to kind of like get away from certain stigmas, uh, which is really unfair for them. But at the same time, you know, like they just have no choice. And likewise, um, you know, there's you know you can always consider like you know you mentioned pop culture exposed, but you can also consider um we have some we have similarities to say arts markets, right? So you're starting to enter like fine art yeah. territory, um, and but even then, you know, like there are certain expectations for for those events um, in terms of, you know, like whether it's dealer galleries in terms of like what kind of work they showcase, or if it's an arts market that's more kind of based around like, you know, you know, people are going there because they want to buy something for their wall, you know, to hang, to decorate yeah. their houses, right? Um, which is also totally fair. But the thing is, um, all of those things, you know, you're, they're leveraging like, um, I guess, things that are people are already aware of. Which is easy, because, you know, which, which is great because it's easier for, to market that way. Uh, so we're kind of like uphill battle, right, in that sense. But I think it's really important for us to avoid like those um, with the easy route, if you will, because you know um, you end up being this thing. It's like if if we just market the prints, you know, side of things, and you say like, hey, you know, you want something for your wall, like come to it. You know, it's like we're like an ask market. Then you know, so you, you start to enter this this situation where that's what the audience expects. And in turn, the artists feel like they're pressured into making, you know, prints for, for walls because that's what the audience wants. Um, whereas the relationship between our audience and our exhibitors should really be about, you know, a respect for the craft. And, yeah. you know, there's a bit more nuance, right? So, you know, we were just talking about, like, why did we make an interactive narrative game for, you know, for this show rather than a, a you know, a comic or anything like that? It's because, you know, there's certain thought that has gone into it, you know? Um, and I think that's what I want. I would like to the conversations to be at Chronicle versus you know like you know have you got work of this genre or do, have you got you know prints or stickers or you know um, obviously those things are sort of like I think for me I feel pretty confident they, they come along with all of that you know because if you have a really good conversation with an artist um, yeah you know if you you're like you you really you know find value in that experience interacting with them you'll be able to um, support them you know uh, through whatever you know, um, media they choose to like put the work out, right? But I think that should be the second step but rather than being at the forefront, you know? I think the other thing is that, um, you know, exhibitors, um, or, you know, so if you're a new exhibitor, you're probably thinking like, what's going to sell, what isn't going to sell. I think um, going along to the first one, I mean, for your first time before you even think about exhibiting and talking to all the artists, you know, or even looking at what you guys do online, and like you said, with the library talks and stuff, are that educates the um, the um, the beginner, or the, you know, we won't call it amateur, but the beginner uh, who wants to come to say do a show or you know be a can, um, sorry be exhibitor, actually can go away and go oh okay now I'm, I probably make a couple badges, I'll go paint a couple things, uh, maybe look at putting a couple um, you know uh, flyers or you know phone numbers, website, you know social media, all this. Because it's all about also being able to market yourself. I think a lot of artists don't understand how to um, 
market themselves and they haven't been taught how to market themselves and they undersell themselves as well, which is kind of um, uh, quite, kind of sad because it means that when you undersell yourself, you're not uh, people don't take you seriously. But also, if you're not educated by other artists around you, then you're actually uh, not going to be taken seriously because you know that whole uh, balancing act of you know um, being being an artist and not starving, but learning from but being able to have so you know like you said 65 the first year and you got 200 now uh, um, exhibitors and they're probably you know 150 of them already have been every kind of year right every time so they have a great understanding of already what's what the attendees are looking for um, but also i think the great thing is that um you know some people come specially to look for something specific and and then there's the quick buys as well, you know, because I've been in sales for about 15 years, right? So, you know, there's the, there's a the bread and butter sale, right? You got you to gotta sell your stickers. And you might sell 100 of those stickers, and you could probably use that to cover your petrol, right? And then you can sell a couple of big paintings for a couple hundred dollars, and that's your payday, and you're good. But if you don't have that understanding from by talking to other artists and talking to yourself before you even get there or think about getting there, I think uh, the, that whole... Um, respect for New Zealand creators won't, won't, isn't going to go away, you know, until people actually, um, especially creatives, they don't educate themselves enough about business and about production and uh, creating a good product. And I think um, we, we, we sometimes create the stigma ourselves by doing that. And, uh, you know, it's as tough as it can be because I know, uh, it's not easy getting a comic book out, right? It's not easy getting a, de a game developed because you've got to find out uh, someone who's um, going to do the script writing or the coding, you know, and someone's going to do the artwork and then you're just going to be sitting there writing away going, yeah, I'm going to create this really cool thing and then you go, I should have got someone to proofread this. I've, I've, I've played a whole bunch of games, right, and the art is great, the story looks really cool, right through it, I'm like, this guy needs an editor. And okay, okay, I can excuse the fact that it's a second language. If it's a second language, please get an editor. But the worst thing is when it's not a second language. And, and you know, when it's a first speaking English language and they don't, because they don't want to get an editor in because they don't want the story to be taken over. Or so they're so scared that their stories were taken over. They don't want to have a look at it, someone to look at it. And I think the challenge, and just like the whole thing about an artist saying, learning from fellow artists to be mentored, to say, hey, look, I've been in the game for a couple of years. You know, what do you need to know? You know, maybe you need to be a bit more uh, wise about how you do things. Do you, like, you know, with the workshops you do, do you teach that as well? I mean, because I think that would be really, um, that would be a great thing to be able to have uh, yeah, happen. Yeah, I mean, we, we um, uh, like there's a long runway leading up to the festival um mm -hmm. and i think for our exhibitors a lot of it you know it starts from the curation process right and it, mm -hmm. and i always try to explain to people like don't treat it as um as like us being elitist or anything you know i honestly like we have it like you know i think i briefly mentioned before it's 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 a support network actually um because yeah. there is a curation process there's three simple criteria um one is originality um which like i said you know it's really because we really want to build this culture of like creative independence so um you know it's not like not to say you can't have some fan art if you're really passionate about you know um a certain thing but um that shouldn't be the majority of your work because this is a slippery slope right because you know um mm -hmm. you know um it, it is because that's the focus of what we're trying to curate and second of all um actually that's that's where you actually can, can, can tell us you know what is your um what makes your idea unique right um so yeah. essentially what we really what we're trying to do is um my light went off what, what we're trying to do is um you know, if you can't like because you know we 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 shoulder tap some pretty you know um experienced practitioners you know with a lot mm -hmm. of mana to help us curate every year um so if you can't communicate to them even just in, in, in like one paragraph like what you're mm -hmm. trying to, what your work is about then like you, you you're you're likely to have quite a hard time talking to the average um mm -hmm. attendee uh who might Sometimes they have like zero knowledge of, um, you know, art, like independent work at all. Um, mm -hmm. 
and uh, so so the second criteria we have is technique, and that's where you know you sort of have to indicate to us like you know that where you are in terms of your craft, and the final thing is professionalism, and people often get confused about like what that means, um, and honestly, that is basically us trying to help our exhibitors in terms of getting an idea you know early on in terms of like what their plan is to, to showcase because essentially we give them a space and they could do a lot of things with it. you know they can prove, they can even push the table like all the way to the back and just treat it as like a here's here come in you know this is a this is a this is a um gallery type of exhibition space you know so they, they have a lot of freedom to do what they want but the thing is mm. a lot of people um might not have the idea and the worst thing is you know you might get placed next to um i don't know like a really prolific artist with you know a internationally recognized like web comic or something um mm. so they've got a lot of material and you know they're so 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 you know um organized or you know you might be next to some you know weirdo workshop artist who who's amazing at their craft and you know they spend you know they spend a long time you know in their in their um you know like off work working on some amazing mm. things so i think the the worst thing is you know like coming unprepared and feeling like really demotivated because everyone else is, you know, you're gonna be being compared to someone else. And that's not really what we're trying to do. Um, because yeah. it's not really a competition, right? So yeah, like that's when you know we, we try to give as much feedback as possible. And um we've some we I mean I've definitely seen some really good like examples of like artists, like you said, you know, they, they come to come you know, um like uh for example like Jeremy who works at Weird Workshop, like the, I think in the turn thirteen he he just visited um, as a attendee, you know, because he was, um, and he just showed like um, some of his work to to um, with a workshop artist at the time, and the year mm -hmm. after that he was exhibiting his like final graduation project, um, and he put together this amazing portfolio as part of that, and you know, and the, by the time we got to on some team festival, like he already had like between that he had an inter internship at where workshop so he was working at, you know, where already, and last year we invited him back to do a talk um, to inspire like you know like young artists to think about like you know how that journey could work for them right like so so i think um this there, there are certain pathways you know in new zealand that are just they just have to navigate uh, so ideally you know we wouldn't what we want that for our exhibitors so to give them the opportunity to grow and you know learn every year mm. um so you know we do other things like we we uh find partners to um you know not only obviously support us now like publishing the art book and things like that but we you know um so our partner like the online printer we get them to offer a special printing rate just for our exhibitors so they can take advantage of you know um mm. like starting that process of thinking about how they can self-publish work and all that yeah. kind of thing um and uh, i think you mentioned you know like like underpricing themselves um that's also but that's, i definitely understand that because like you know it, that's another slippery slope in terms of like if you feel you're worried about your work being compared to someone else and you start to I guess you know you try to compete on the price level then it kind of harms everyone so um we tend to have like you know we have a lot of discussion prior to the festival in terms of what i guess people are thinking of you know you know what like for example what kind of printing processes people are doing and, and what they're charging for them and you know pricing wise yeah. i just just to get everyone um an idea on like you know especially more professional artists to to let them pass down some um you know just industry like you know um standards if you will yeah um, and i think that benefits everyone right because the, uh, if, if no one ever talks about like oh you know what like why this you know like why additional 50 of, of a, a gk print is worth more than you know like a digital print that you printed like five thousand copies of um then we'll yeah. never get to that nuance more nuance you know in terms of like um the general public understanding like the value of of art mm. no the cool thing is like um i've this evening I was watching a anime, right? And I didn't know what it was going to be about. And so I just said, because I'm, I'm, I'm being just um, like designing, I think about 11 different, um, she's this week, superhero uh, icon logos for t-shirts and costumes and all this stuff. So on the side, I was watching the pet of Saka, Sakus Rasau, Saka Rasau? The pet girl of Sakurasa. No, the cool, th I was like, I don't even know what it's about. Like, so I'm watching this and it's about art, right? It's all about art. It's all about these guys talking about becoming artists. Uh, one wants to be a game developer. Uh, one's looking at doing um, writing for the anime that the, uh, one of the girls is writing. Um, and then another one says a manga. 
there's an artist um, who's very famous uh, fine art artist uh, who comes from England to study manga, right, in Japan. And she's very well known famously. And so she comes to this house to uh, sorority, whatever, I don't know, uh, house anyway. And so it's part of the school. So it just goes on and to talk about art and talk about competition and all this. And one thing I found really interesting, because we just talked about this professionalism and technique and originality, one of the girls uh, wants her to stop doing manga, right? And she's, she's because she's a well-famous, I mean, really famous uh, fine art uh, painter. And she goes on about how she, you know, she wants to go back and she doesn't want to go back. You know, the girl wants to take it back, but the artist doesn't want to go back because she loves doing manga. She's like, you know. And so um, they have this feud uh, and the girl goes, the one that wants to take me back, you know, you caused me to give up art, right? She goes on about how she was this because of her, her granddad's uh, um, school didn't, you know, suffered because all the, um, nobody could be as good as this girl. So they felt down and down and down. And so they stopped going. And then this girl was like, you know, and I sat next to you for 10 years and I, and I afterwards I just thought I could never be as good as you, you know, and I gave up my, my own art. And she's like, I didn't even know that. All I was, I was happy about was you having you there next to me for 10 years. And the other thing was that she was, it's like competing, that whole idea of competing with someone next to you. It, it, you know, it's kind of, there's a saying um, in the Bible, right? Um, and, uh, the whole idea of iron sharpening iron, you know, like uh, the uh, the um, it's kind of it's kind of a weird saying, but um, it's like having a mentor who's smarter than you, who you know who's who's not telling you to compete with me, but saying how how you know I'll, I'll help you to you know get your knife sharper, you know, get out there, get your um, brush clean, and you know, or get your um, Wacom tablet, you know. Yeah, like, I, I, I get it. You know, we're, we're trying to help people be the best, like be the best yeah. you, right? You know, um, yeah. And I, I'm like, you can't, you, yeah. I think that's the thing with like, you know, I keep going back to this. It's like, like genres or mediums and you know, all these things. Like they're they're easy, um, but they're, they're good as like com communication tools. But at some point, yeah, you have to really communicate like you know who you are, like authentically as a person, as an artist, as you know what your work is about, and all these things. And you have to like escape, like you, you learn, you know, um, your craft, like you learn genres and you learn like industry pipelines and methods and all these things. But then at some point you have to like escape that, like um, the, the system, right? Um, unless the goal is to work in as part of a industry, you know, um, in which case, you know, there, there are certain like, you know, I mean, there's certain rules, but those rules are, are because, you know, like at the end of the day, it's they're delivering a product, you know? Um, right. so it's a service of, pro of a product. So if you're working yeah. for something like for yourself, then, you know, um, so those rules are gone, but at the same time, like then you have to spend the extra effort in terms of like communicating, like what your work is about and who you are. Um, so yeah, there's definitely no point competing with someone else. Cause then, um, you know, like they're doing their thing. Right. So like, <laughs> you know, unless you're trying to be a better version of them, in which case, why, yeah. why would you, right. <laughs> um, like no one wins, you know, as part of that. I mean, like they say, like there's only one Stan Lee. Nobody else be Stan Lee, right? You can't be. You can't be like Mike. You can try, but you, you know, you're not going to be Mike. And I think the whole idea of authenticity um, is lost on some people because they want the instant fame of instant social media and the time and work to build up an audience. Is you know, is it takes time, and I think um, um, that whole two year period allows people to go, I can find, you know, uh, I can um, get better at my technique, get better at my style, clean up my line work or my digital work, whichever, learn how to, um, you know, read a few more books, whatever, watch uh, watch how other people are doing the coloring, digital coloring and stuff. I mean, I suck at that, <laughs> you know, but that doesn't mean that there aren't people who are more qualified out there. And I think the other thing, cool thing about having these sort of um, events is that, that it's, you know, it's stable, right? But not only that, that you can meet other people that are part of what they're interested in what you're doing and you can build up community around that. But not only that, you can build up work, um, work relationships, 
And I think the idea, because I know, like, say, like a graphic artist says, well, I'm, I'm interested in gaming, but I have no idea how to do it. it comes to Chromacon, and you've got a game thing happening there, and rock on up to the guy and start talking about how it works, or the girl, or whoever. And I think that element of sharing and um, is is good because it's been lost for a long time because everybody's been like, I'm doing my thing, you know, I'm doing my thing and I want my stuff to be done my way. And now it's like, hey, you know what? The world's big. <laughs> you know, work, you can work with someone from South Africa, right? And you talk to them on, on, on live stream and talk to them and, you know, hey, is this line better? Uh, this is what I was trying to get at here. Uh, can you fix this, please? And, you know, without even leaving your home. But then the other thing is the, um, being able to then be able to take that and come to Chromacone Con, you know, and go, hey, been working on this for two years, man. I'm ready now. And I think the, I'm looking forward to next year. I think this whole lockdown has helped people to actually realize the benefits of actually being able to utilize this, you know, this space that, I haven't really looked into before and in this in a visual in a creative way I think for me I found it was very interesting that uh you know especially when you did the hui right the other day the other week I found it very interesting because it you put us in touch with someone who none of us would have a chance on our own to get in touch with unless we you know worked really hard at it. and you had um was it was that Sarah from creative um New Zealand yeah that's right yeah, talking about how, talking about um, visual um, visual arts and uh, funding for that. How did you um, set that up? Because I mean, you know, you were saying something about having to go through funding yourself to find that to set it up. Um, how did that work um, out? Well, I uh, since near the end of last year, um, I've been helping to us helping to assess some of the Creative New Zealand funding. Um, as an external assessor. So it, um, for me, it was seeing a lot of artists in our community not really engaging mm. with you know, our local public funding for the arts, um, possibly because of some, you know, like some, some of those stigmas I, I mentioned before, because obviously traditionally um, a lot of fine artists and um, you know, like, um, like art forms that are more established um, mm you know, th th some of the funding opportunities are sort of designed for that. Um, so I just, you know, we ran a hui to help, you know, um, young artists, emerging artists, or artists who might be working in, I don't know, like comics, and they feel like, oh, my work is too lowbrow for something like this. Um, hmm. But kind of understand the process. Because, you know, like, if you never, if none of, like, say, Chromacon artists, like, in terms of the work they do, if none of them ever applies to CNZ, CNZ will never understand there is a need in the arts yeah. community for that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, I mean, like you said, um, with Chromacon, mm -hmm. like we have a lot of, we, we obviously try to get some public funding to, to run it because, you know, it is free for the public. Um, so we need to be sustainable some way. But uh, mm -hmm. so like a lot of these things, like in, in knowledge and experience comes from running Chromacon, which is essentially is like creating an independent work. You know, it's just an event versus, you know, a comic or game. Um, I still have this, we still have the same, challenges you know like how do you do this thing well you know um well how to afford it right um how to communicate yeah. how to get it out there so um you know like communicating why chroma Con should exist and you know like the how and what like you know like of you know the reason for existing and the benefits and the impact and all these things it's very similar mm -hmm. to coming up with the project idea and communicating that right so it doesn't have to be for the public like funding it could be you know this like literally for the public somewhere someone at Chromacon. But I think yeah. the just the, the communication process is quite important. Um and it's something that's really beneficial for artists because um I think the reason why you might like artists might have like you know face the challenge of d developing something for themselves is mm. the fact that often um other people who are, who are better at communicating have already taken like you know um they've taken ownership of those like creative control. Um, yeah. So by the time it comes down to you, as an artist, you might just be a service provider. Um, yeah. And so I think once you, if you become a service provider for too long, then you're familiar with the process of getting a brief and 
they're delivering to spec, but not necessarily how to um, communicate to someone to, to get them to invest in your own idea, uh, right? And um, so, you know, like, I think a lot of stuff I learned is, you know, similar to what you said about, oh, if you're working in a certain field, uh, you come to Chromacon, you might be able to find like a game developer, like a programmer who work with you on a, on a game or something, right? It's a very similar concept. Like, I think a lot of, like everything I learned about um, running an event like Chromacon, I learned from people who are not in the arts, like in the necessary, or maybe like people who are not illustrators. So like for the yeah. first fest, I was very lost because mm -hmm. I wanted to run it, but then I realized I have no experience. And then I realized also, I didn't actually network with anyone who might have experience um, yeah. doing something like this. Because pr prior to that, my idea of networking was uh, I need to connect with other people who like do the same thing as I do. Um, yeah. But you know that's the, that's the limitation sometimes. You know you kind of have to step side outside of your comfort zone to learn things from other people, and um, they might be like horrible experiences, but they actually you know you can learn a lot from failure, right? I think a lot, you know a lot of what I said about communicating an idea and you know get asking uh, uh, convincing someone to invest in your idea, a lot of it comes from um, some of my experiences working in film, you know, like production, mm -hmm. and um, if you look at how the film industry works, you know, like just on the basic level. You know, let, let, let's just say Hollywood blockbusters, right? Like yeah. there's a trifecta of like, you know, in terms of where the, um, I guess, you know, how how the, the creative like, you know, process works. And often it's, you've got the investor, you've got, you know, the investor, you've got the, the producer, and then maybe the director and then the, the person who comes off the actual IP, you know, mm. on the artist side. So you've got a comic oh. and someone's like, you know, adapting it or something, right? And often the yeah. artist is at the, you know, they're the, 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 the lowest in the food chain because it's usually right. like the producer saw this, the IP like, thing was the next one I was going to ask about. Sorry, but carry on. Well, so, so, so the most, like what I'm trying to get at, it's like the most common scenario is like an investor might be like, oh, we need like something to fulfill this this audience, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, because uh, this is a hot thing right now. So like, and then the producer might like develop a project, you know, um, and they'll maybe they'll design it around a certain like actor actress that's really famous and as a vehicle yeah. for them or something. And then eventually they'll be like, okay, let's just pick up this IP to fit it, you know. So or like develop something. And then the artist is like the lowest of the totem chain, but that's because you had the lowest level of investment from the get go, right? Like you know, mm -hmm. you got you you came in last, and and that's that's why you lose all the like creative creative control. Um, yeah. So like some of the best independent artists who are like making a lot of value out of whatever they're working on is because he understood how that process works. So they put themselves first, like right. they initiated the process of convincing people to invest in the idea. Um, so, you know, essentially you got to invest in yourself. And once you've done that, like every little bit counts to that level, when you finally like make something happen, then you have more control over the area else because you invested more into it than other people have. Um, but that's the process, you know, you, you, you know, you can't say, Oh, I don't want to engage with that because, um, you know, like I don't believe in like you know, like investors or like producers or whatever. Then, yeah. then why can't you do what they do, right? Um, you gotta, but then you have to first learn why they do what they do and how they do it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, I'm not saying like you could necessarily all learn all of this from doing Chromacon, but I think like this is a starting point, right? You know, and if, if if you if you make something for Chromacon and you find like oh the audience is not engaging with it, then it's a very good you know place to kind of evaluate like, why necessarily. And then you look at what other people are doing that might be successful, um, and how they're communicating, you know, their work to their audience. You know, and it's it's totally not because oh um, they're pricing their prints like differently to I am. You know, that's that's a very minor factor I think at the end of the day. Hmm. I think um, the the other thing there is like. Um, a lot of misunderstanding around it, isn't it? Like the idea that um, what you're trying to do, especially if it's a sim, like fan art is the weirdest thing because like, you know, you could have someone like 20 people doing the same stuff and it'll be the, exactly the same thing, but someone will decide, well, I like that one because it's a slightly different. And you're going, well, my work sucks. <laughs> you know, and you go away thinking really down, but like at the end of the day, it's the guy on the other end, you know, of the counter that's on the other side of the counter going, well, yeah, I'm not feeling that today. Maybe tomorrow I'll be feeling it. And it's, it's very finicky. And like, you know, I, I think there's a lot of time, a lot of people don't understand that the, 
uh, retailer is just like us. I mean, sorry, the customer is just like us because we're finicky when we go shopping ourselves. So, you know, the, um, the other person's going on the other side of the counter is going to be the same way. But being able to engage, um, and like I said, coming to um, you might not understand everything on how to deal with from the first time, but the idea of being able to talk to other artists who are, I think that's what I was trying to think of. This is your industry, right? So this is this is what you're trying to get into. So if you're an artist and you're just starting out, this is where you're supposed to learn from. And I think um, uh, being afraid to ask questions is actually going to be detrimental to your own career than it is to those other people's career because they're just going to keep moving along. But if you don't ask the questions you're thinking in your head because you think it's going to be stupid, well, then, you know, uh, you're not going to get the answer. One of the things, the reason I say that is because when we were doing the hui the other day, I thought I asked the most stupidest question, right? Why do you, you know, I don't see why, um, and it was only one question I asked. Why, you know, why Why should, um, what is it? Create New, like New Zealand. <laughs> Find podcasts, and I'm and you're like, because of this and this, I'm like, huh, I understand now. And I'm like, then I went away thinking, geez, that was a stupid question to ask. Why did you think about it? It's like, hold on, I asked and I got a good answer <laughs> because that made me think and go, you know what, I might, I might think about that next time. You know, I might go for that funding next time. And I think that's the thing. It's like the fear of asking the wrong questions um, or, you know, asking what you th what we ourselves think is a dumb question. I think um, knowing, um, because I, one of the greatest things I learned that time was that from that hui was how you broke down the, um, the pitch that the person had done about the, you know, the, and from the, by the time, from the start to the end, I went from, like I said, from not wanting it to wanting it, and and actually saying you know thinking of how to tell the artist or the creator how to actually get funding to do it, you know mm. because I was so excited by it. And I think that, that sort of thing um, you can only get that by asking questions, but from experience, right? From people who actually have gone through that, have broken it down, and you get that experience from other people. And you can't. Or, and the thing, the fear is that we think that we're not going to be able to. We get, we can do it on our own. And I think um, something like or, or, or that, or like not be able to do it on your own, right? Um, yeah. yeah, and I think, so I think what you're getting, yeah, what you're getting at is really like there's no definitely no harm in asking questions. Like it's much worse to have false assumptions. Like that's much worse. Um, and you know, it doesn't mean you have to say yes to everything, but also right. it doesn't mean you know you can you just like immediately go to the no. Um, so I think it's, it's it's it it works both ways, right? It's, it's asking mm -hmm. questions, but also accepting, you know. Um, constructive criticism or like just questions in return, you know, because often yeah. it's so, um, I mean, I guess, you know, the, the flow of information is very really weird these days, right? Because everything works so fast. So you might post something mm -hmm. and you see like, oh, guess no likes. So you immediately just think no one cares about it. Um, yeah. But, you know, maybe the, the way that you're putting it out there is is not, you know, um, it's not mm -hmm. the correct way um, or that's not the right audience for you. Um, but also there's, there's a lot of factors, you know, because like, um, I mean, I come from, like, like I said, I come from a time where the internet ask community was there was, a, there was a, some respect for credit, create uh, crit, constructive criticism, um, mm. which is a little bit lost these days because you know you, on one hand you have a lot of um, uh, you know resources in terms of like um, learning out there, so I think a lot of artists are easier it's easier for them to like learn um, and pick up techniques, um, but at the same time. There's a lot of there's you know there's less room I think in terms of like just feedback and you know a process of like like introspection in terms of um, like why you're doing what you're doing, which is I think a wall that a lot of art, like artists, especially young artists, they'll hit eventually. Um, yeah, it's it's easy to say um, I will pursue this style or technique because um, the resources are there for you now. Right, because in the past, a lot of artists are stumbling around in the dark, and maybe that process of taking longer to get to a more mature um, style or technique is actually very helpful because they had a lot of room to experiment and think about, like you know, what works for them and you know, like what how they want to express their ideas. 
Um, whereas nowadays, it's so it's so quick for you to see like, oh, this thing is popular or, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think there's some inherent danger in that. You know, you're previously you're talking about like fan art. Um, yeah. I think it's a similar concept. You know, this it's, it's so like, you know, you're trying to get to this nation. And yeah. if there's a lot of like, um, the people I like, just show you that here's a lot of shortcuts for you to get there, then yeah, like, you know, it's easy to take those routes. But then you might find that you're actually going starting to very often a different direction to where you actually want to end up. And often yeah. you might, you know, and, and, and maybe you've only set like short-term goals for yourself. So you just keep arriving at destinations where you feel like comfortable, you're comfortable with. But then at some point you'll realize like, oh, actually I'm, I've been going, heading in towards the wrong direction this whole time, you know? Um, Cause it's, you know, like it, it's like YouTube creators, you know, there's only a few people who are actually really successful at doing YouTube. You know, but yeah. it's very glamorous on the, on the outside. And often, um, I think if you want to get a lot of subscribers and all of that, there's definitely ways, you know, like what's in trend. You, what's can, in buy, trend. Yeah, you can buy the subscribers. Yeah, there's trends <laughs> in terms of like what people do, right? You might, you want to start yeah. some drama or like all of that. But at yeah. the end of the day, like what are the, like who are the audience that you're cultivating, you know? Because they might not stick around for the long term because you never along the way actually, um, establish like who you are as a creator um and at some point you're gonna hit that wall and you have to like almost <laughs> work backwards to, to try and get there um because you might be following in the footsteps of someone um who's doing you know something that's unique to them and they're they're in it for long haul and they'll always like, own a part of that and um you, you know like you, you you have to discover that for yourself right? I think, I mean, yeah, you're right about the whole um, getting, try, trying to get to the quickness of it all. Um, as, yeah, you're losing um, technique, really, you're learning how to deal with emotion, uh, letting go of your art, letting someone actually say, hey, look, this, you know, maybe if you did this a bit differently, it might work better for you. Or if you change that sort of writing, it might read better. Or, you know, if you, you know, tweak that, um, you know, uh, tweak that, um, coding it might work better and you're like no no i know my coding you know and so on and you're like you know it, thing is that if, if along like you said along the wall there will be a hole to what you're doing and people will see that hole and you know unless you know we we see people that are in this game for 50 odd years you know you look at i mean you know taika taika was doing boy and stuff like that you know 15 minute films and stuff and we're like oh no he's been Thor, it was like a big deal. I know he was still doing this little little films before he got to where he's got to, and they picked him up, and now you know he's where he is. I think the whole um, social media, I think it's got a you know it's got a lot to answer for for that because the whole idea of that we need fame, we need it now, you know, right now. If I'm not doing it well, I'm going to do something like you said. I'm going to do something drastic to get that fame or buy that um, extra you know thousand followers so that. You know, it's this consistency. I think there's something else. Yeah, talking about Joe Rogan, we're talking about podcasts, right? So the biggest name in podcasts or interviewers and stuff for 10 years, you know, doing it. And there's now it's number one uh, on podcasts. But consistency, you know, consistency, 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 doing it regularly uh, and just building and building. And I think... Um, Unless we have older people uh, who have been in the game longer next to us as young artists trying to come up, I think we're not going to have uh, long-lasting artists. We're going to have the starving artists again. And I think that's, what, that's probably been what's been the problem in the past of the starving artists is because they haven't allowed themselves to come next to someone who's actually in that field or maybe even opposite to the field. Say, you know, maybe they're doing carving and you're doing a painting, you know, but they actually still understand how form and functions, you know, how um, how to illustrate something that you get the right way around it. Mm. And that's why I think there's more starving artists in the past than there are now. And I think yeah. if, um, especially with like, say, if you've got something like Chroma Cone, you've got a lot of people who actually have a lot of knowledge. I mean, think of the thousands of years of knowledge that's in that room every time, you know, and, mm -hmm. Couple questions. Yeah, I, I think I often tell people like you know you you can take it. I mean I don't know if this is this works for everyone. You know it works for me, and we'll see where, where it takes me, right? But um, you know it's it's you don't have to always like 
you know, I guess almost be like, it's, you know, split personality in that way where, you, you know, I'm going to put my business hat on. I'm going to put my artist hat on. Um, so I remember talking with a curator friend of mine um, in the fine arts, you know, like many, many years ago before I started crumbling up before anything. And we were just discussing like, what is the difference between an artist and um, like a music, like a gallery curator in terms of how they evaluate a piece of work, right? And I sort of realized um, even back then that um, there's actually a quite, a, you know, there's a unique difference in the, in the sense that because you know, the curator has to like, you know, um, they had to try and break because art is so subjective, you know, so they had to try and break mm -hmm. things down to be able to like communicate to um, the, you know, even more layman, like with a person, like a collector or like I mean, just an art lover who might not understand the context and the nuances. Um, so they almost have to be, so they end up being kind of like a gatekeeper or, you know, even like a critical reviewer they have, and a gatekeeper in the sense that they, they had to put like yes or no, like in, in terms of like, this is good, this is bad. Um, yeah. And that's not something I want to do for Chromagon, you know, because I, I don't think that's what the purpose of, you know, why we're running a Chromagon. Um, so even though I say there's a curation panel like that, it's actually a very different motivation behind it. Like for me, I take that same approach as I would take uh, as an artist, you know? So for me, when I see a piece of art, um, I might, I might, I might not like the style. I might not like the subject mm -hmm. matter. There might, there might be a lot of factors I don't like, um, but that's mm -hmm. totally fine, you know, because uh, you know you want to make the most use of your, like you know, I guess even like mental capacity. You know, if you're gonna add it to your visual vocabulary and in, in the library somehow, then it's worthwhile yeah. to to um, you know, there's something you can learn like with anything, right? Um, especially if this thing has a big audience and it's popular then it's worth taking the time to, to think about like, okay, if you don't like it, like why is it that you don't like it about it, right? So that actually helps think for your own work. Um, or if you don't like the certain way, like the business model works, then it's good, to, that informs you. So, okay, you know, when you're doing something, you might avoid that. Um, so it's, it's always something you can learn, um, even though it might be something that you just like, that's totally not your thing, right? Uh, whereas I think as a, as a curator or like a, um, like a reviewer, you're sort of asked to do something else, which is basically come up with a conclusion about something. Um, so, you know, like we were talking about, you know, like wood cover and stuff like that. Like anyone who can communicate quite clearly or even succinctly, like why they're doing something and what it means to them and, you know, all the all of those factors, right? Um, that's worth learning from, right? Because mm -hmm. ideally, like the better you are at doing that for yourself, then, you know, like you'll get far, right? Yeah. That that remind me again of that same anime because he the because he was thinking about being a game developer, he he spent ages getting his pitch together right that five minute pitch and he goes before uh, before the um, um, the reviewer and the guy goes who's a, who's a famous you know uh, game um, game developer himself and he goes just tell me um, why are you doing this and he's there going stammering away even though he knows everything. And he's just stammering away and just scared out of fear and all this. And it's like there is a hurdle if you you know to know know thyself, right? You gotta know what you what what you're gonna do at the end of the day and what you what your artwork is selling, uh, what you're trying to say through it through it. And I think yeah, I think the whole um, the whole shift in the culture, the art culture in New Zealand is is very positive towards um, creators now than before, like independent, you know, local creators than before. Before it was like, yeah, 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 no, no, no. You know, we'll, we'll get somebody from overseas and we'll, you know, we'll buy their stuff. And now it's like, well, let's see what you can do. Let me see if you're going to be still around next year. Let me see how your work changes and stuff. And and you know, if you're going to be here next year, you know, I think, um, yeah, I'm I'm really excited for what's happening in New Zealand, and I think it's uh, there's so much great stuff coming, and there's so much great stuff already here, and I think this year has really forced people to actually think outside the box, really, you know, mm -hmm. creatively, really to think, well, well, what am I going to do when I can't get out of the house? You know, and all that sort of thing. What am I going to do if I just got to wear a mask all the time and stuff like that? And it just makes you think creatively. And I think um, that's allowed. I'm 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 looking forward to see what you know 
what sort of stuff comes out from this whole, you know, environment. I know with, um, I know with, um, you know, was it New Zealand Comics? Yeah, New Zealand Comic Creators, you know, they've got the next one of that out and they put a, they're going to be putting out one called um, uh, Lockdown, right? You know, next um, graph is going to be about Lockdown, all the different creators, uh, their collectives talking about, um, yeah, around Lockdown, I guess. Is that they're around right lockdown or whatever, but I mean, you know, stuff like this quality stuff coming out of New Zealand, you know, and you kind of think, well, a couple of years ago it wasn't there, you know, a couple of years ago it was just zines, 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 and it was like little pamphlets, and now it's actual, you know, great stuff coming out of this. And uh, what you know, you're talking about you were doing your, um, work as well, so what have you got coming out? I mean, apart from you know, the art books that you put out, um, what sort of stuff have you been putting out? as well um so, i mean this is this is a little bit early days but um mm -hmm. we like throughout sort of lockdown um sort of doing a bit of you know research and development right mm -hmm. um so like you said there's a lot it's a good time for introspection so um you know i've got, I've got a plan to like to develop chroma as a like an independent arts label uh, hopefully um that you know ideally i guess because we also have a problem where you know we're trying to create run run an event and you know because yeah. we're so focused on that creative independence thing we often have to justify to people like you know that it is actually really impactful and valuable you know making a lot of like um uh you know because like i said you know no matter how many people we have like the, because of the proportion of like you know audience yeah. um it's an uphill battle so uh you know i had sort of had this idea of like can you know we work with New Zealand like some of our artists to support um, them to make new work. And I'm um, certainly just, you know, very much looking outwards, um, you know, because if you think about it, like we're very, um, we're, we're so isolated from the rest of the world that mm. like, you know, we're essentially, we are locked down all the time anyway, right? <laughs> you know, because um, if you never leave New Zealand, then, you know, like how are you accessing yeah. information of like what's, what's happening out there, you know? Um, so, if you think about Chromacon as like a really good like local platform, because you know, like I said, the, the 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 challenge is always like even more uphill, right? You know, the less people know about you, and the, the less they're familiar with who you, like who you are and what your surroundings and what your backgrounds are, then um, you know, the the harder it is to to get them to understand you know your work. So, you know, like I said, if you can't com if you can't communicate what you do to like a New Zealand artists who are very knowledgeable then it's harder for you to communicate that to um, New Zealand audiences at Chromacon. And it's going to be even harder for you to communicate that to international audiences um, who are unfamiliar with like what New Zealand workers are as well. So um, so that's a slight tangent. But in, in a sense, like we're work, you know, um, working on a couple of zine projects with um, New Zealand creators. So mm. you know, stepping into a bit of a curation role, um, looking to publish some work and uh, most of it is, you know, we're going to have it on Chroma and it's going to be, you know, published by Chroma. And um, so, you know, we're going to try and um, I'm really trying to develop a process where it's very, um, hopefully like, quite sustainable, but, you know, it's it's going to be, you know, it's going to be, have a, you know, ethical um, relationship with artists in terms of, you know, them getting a fair remuneration for their work. Um, and also, we, you know, like I would like to um, have, you know, the po portion of the, pro you know, any, Pro, like profits going towards, you know, like a slush fund for Chromacon, you know, and also um, some social impact, you know, for example, if we make prints, you know, we'll plant like X amount of trees with every print type of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's just like a project I'm working on. And um, like, it, it, I guess the goal is like, I'm very looking, much looking outwards. So I'm hoping to like, you know, um, take whatever work we make, you know, to international audiences. Um, you know, and when, once things get better, we can maybe like, we can tour like uh, other art book fairs and art shows and things like that, and maybe develop some kind of like uh, like cross distribution, you know, partnerships with other independent publishers mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, so that's sort of something like I'm working on, I mean, alongside my own personal projects. Yeah, I'm working hey, on. Um, the <laughs> we've got about ten more minutes. Uh, we're, we're over about fifty minutes, going into two hours. I, th I promise you an hour. Well, we talked about an hour. <laughs> But it's um, it's been a good discussion. So what I want to talk about before um, I get to your final words, last words, uh, copyright and um, artists and how um, 
you know, people are coming out with their own stuff out there and you've got 5,000 people looking at it and you've got other creators looking at it. And um, do you um, educate or have run into issues with um, IP theft or art theft? People claiming, you know, buying something and saying, oh, no, it's, you know, selling it off as their own and stuff like that. Have you run into that problem? Um, it's quite common, you know. Uh, there's a lot of artists in the community who suffer from that, for sure. Um, you know, you definitely, like, the, the, I will mean, the first step is, like, as artists, we need to be very aware of that, you know, like, stuff like copyright theft or being taken advantage of in terms of, like, spec work. Um, you, know, companies, you know, if you're doing work, like, you know, you know, you should be properly remunerated and all those things. Like, across the board, we should be quite knowledgeable about mm -hmm. it. And, you know, certainly, you know, we'll probably try to cover one of those topics in future hoois. Um, mm -hmm. But... I mean, it is, you know, like we first need to like call it out when we see it, right? And then yeah. we need to, like, it comes down to, again, like a cultural shift. And mm -hmm. it's up to, I think it's the most important, because like, you can't, it's, often things are so quick, fast now. It's it's, so, it's hard to like prevent, prevent it from happening, especially yeah. if it's like, you know, there's no repercussions because like, you know, they might just take something for like a temporary thing in you know, for, you know use because the web works so moves so fast so by the time you know even if you ask them to take it down it like they don't care anyway because they've already made you already used up you know whatever yeah, value happened, get out of like borrowing your work um it happened to so, a um a local friend of ours here um you know person i'm with dots and um yeah was on um t-shirts everywhere yeah and sometimes it's not even about like like physical production it, it's just about like you know just using your work for something without you know accreditation right and um yeah. i you know at least a lot of things people need to be aware of like for example twitter is really great for um building audiences but you need to be very aware that twitter um is because you know essentially you know the reason why twitter is so good for news is because they allow any news organization to like embed tweets without accreditation yeah. um and that's in the ter terms and conditions you know, so, uh, so like, you know, last year, for example, I had like a video um, of me going viral. Um, ironically, it was about like deep fakes and, you know, essentially like, like, you know, portrait rights and things like that. Like, I, you know, like I was trying to talk about that. And then yeah. you've got like basically, basically every major news organization just like, you know, using my video without any accred like accreditation or even just like asking me at all. Yeah. And, and like, that's what I learned the hard way. It's like, because Twitter allows that, and um, mm -hmm. it's in the terms and contracts. Like, and then no, and, and then there's nothing you can protect other than like you know closing your, um, deleting the post or like closing your, um, you know, uh, account or anything. So I mean, that's that's a very minor example, but like a lot of there's a lot of holes like that, and you have to like first of all, as artists, you need to be aware of, it, and you need to like call it out when you see it, and um, and you need to obviously we need to make other, uh, especially young artists, be aware mm -hmm. of that. Um, because it might not impact them as much as you know someone that's more established and they you know they have a lot more investment in the work, but it's gonna you know it like it trickles down right. It's gonna harm you in the long term. The, the, the other thing I just remembered was like today, like I hadn't been on uh, Instagram for about a week or so, or put anything out because I had nothing to say, <laughs> you know, nothing to put out. And um, so because I'd been working on all these logos, and I was like, you know, I want to put up these logos to show that we've got this comic book work that we're going to be putting out and i'm like well it's under my real name that i own it but i use my art name for everything on social media right so and even on my books it's my art name it's not my actual you know like what's there no function that's on everything that i said you know that i write and do artwork that's how what's known as but ownership of my prop you know all that design and stuff is my own real name so i was like what am I, I don't know if I want to put all this stuff out there without with my real name on it, you know, but I do want to have my art name on it. So I do this, you know, I put this um, one logo out and I put the huge malfunction on the top of it, right? <laughs> like totally put huge on it because I knew because it's very, you know, it's, it took me ages to do it because it's going to be part of our comic books logo for the cover and of the team and all this. And I'm like, yes, I do want. Oh, I do want to build an audience for it, yet so I do want to be have um, advertising out there to promote and work out there. 
but I do know in the back of my head that, yeah, somebody would go, that's a nice little thing. I'm going to use that and put on a T-shirt or something, or I'm going to actually put on my own comic book, and I'm going to do this. And I think a lot of times um, New Zealand, um, you know, new, new, new creators aren't aware of how quickly, like you just said, how quickly it can be taken and away from you, and uh, it's gone. You know, you can never have it. I, I mean, I ran into that years ago, so I'm, I'm very cautious, cautious about copyright issues and stuff. But still, it happens all the time. I mean, you know, it, it's... Um, it goes back it's, to what I was saying before. Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing you can do is to really, like, um, you know, obviously have an understanding of, like, what your work is about and constantly mm -hmm. communicate that to your audience. And yeah. the, the best thing you can protect, you know, that can protect your work is your audience, you know? Because oh. if, you, if you're so good at, like, if your audience understands your work so well, like, they will call it out when they see it, you know? Because they know, like, oh, this thing, you know, belongs to you. And, or, like, I mean, that's why people do, you know, when you think about, like, fan art, what is fan art? It's because, like, you're working, you're, you're, you're like, creating of something that's, you know, um, somebody else's. Established, yeah. Right. Yeah. And no matter, like, you know, even if you don't say it's fan art, people are going to realize it's fan art, you know, for what it yeah. is. Um, so, you know, the, the, you know, like, you can say what, what you want with, with that, but, like, there's a great area in terms of, like, you know, copyright there, right? But, um, mm. If you can do that, you know, if you can make your work so um, intrinsically, you know, like tied to who you are, whether it's an art handle or your real, you know, name, then that's gonna, you, you know, that's 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 better than anything in terms of like copyright protection, you know. Well, there um, is the other side of that whole um, fan art thing is that like you know you could still be actually working on your own thing while you're selling the you make the bread and butter, right? With the fan work, you can still be working yeah. on your own thing. And I think a lot of time people, I think, uh, like you said, they get stuck into one way because they're taking shortcuts without realizing that they could be actually being better off not taking that shortcut. And I, I've seen some great um, fan art, and that's what really um, blows me away. I mean, I collect some of them because, you know, especially anime and stuff and comic book stuff. But at the end of the day, I'd rather be paying the artist who's actually done the original work, you know, um, who's there with the, you know, saying this is what I, this is my art style and, you know, such and such. Hey, do me a Batman, but in your style, you know, and it's it's kind of the thing, or you know, do Rick and Morty in your style, and it's it's kind of the balance between your style and copying somebody else's, you know, and it's. I think a lot of people, um, this whole instant, uh, getting stuck in the whole fan art thing l might lose that in the long run, you know? Like you said, like, you're gonna end up being a 70 year old doing fan art for the rest of your life. <laughs> you know, yeah. but there's only, yeah, there's only one Mike Mignola, right? And yeah, yeah. there's only one Todd McFarlane and look at, you know, they own their own stuff and they could have been doing their, somebody else's stuff. You know, they do sometimes, but they still stick their own thing. I mean, there's honestly, there's no harm in it, you know, um, it just, it's just about like why you're doing the fan art, you know, even, right. Um, you, you need to be like communicating that to your audience rather than being, um, just going out to find what's popular and doing that, you know, cause like if that's your only motivation, then, you know, um, you're yeah. not really building anything for yourself. Right? The other, um, the other thing it's like being a covers band, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, you, you, you could be, you could work a bit harder and be a, the next, you know, such and such, you know, original mm. band. That, that's a, that's or, a good comparison. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Or you could just be a covers band doing, playing the pubs all night, or you could be playing stadiums. If you, you know, if you work a bit harder and, you know, even keep playing the pubs, but go and work on some original stuff. And every now and then add that original, you know, song into your pub stuff, you know? Mm. And I think, yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting thing. I mean, I don't, I, I mean, I don't mind fan art, I think it's a cool thing, but how long do you do it for? You know, it's yeah. like, when do you start doing your own thing and say, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm not a great artist. <laughs> like, I, I, I will try to stay away from art as much as I can illustrating that is, you know, but I'll, de I'll design all day long. Um, you know, so I think um, we've been talking for a long time, two hours, <laughs> but it's been great. And I think, um, you know, uh, having so much knowledge built over so many years and so much experience, um, 
I mean, I'm still learning. <laughs> so, you know, like I, I might look back on this and say like, oh, <laughs> that probably wasn't the best like advice. But, you know, that, that's like you said, like, we talk about that, right? don't, don't be afraid to put it out there. And, um, you know, if, you, if someone calls you out on it, actually, that's actually good because you learn something. Right? Well, the other thing is like, we're always learning. I mean, um, you know, I wanted to do a um, workshops for comic books five years ago, right? Looking to do it now, you know, sort of thing. It's nothing instantaneous. And I think we're just learning because we get the experience slowly over time. I think um, I, I feel for this generation because they kind of like everything's now, now, now. And, you know, I just hope um, it doesn't fail them too much, you know. It doesn't whack them in the butt too much because they're, they're wanting now and not doing the work because putting something like in, you know, comic book, it takes years sometimes to come together, putting a game together. I mean, it's like, I don't, I don't tend to give, um, I mean, we talk a lot about fan art and all that stuff, yeah. but like, honestly, I'm not saying not to do it, you know, cause like yeah. all the young artists love doing it. And, um, and there's a lot of, because honestly, like we, we, we suddenly like sound real old if we get into this territory. Right? It's, it's one of those like you know get off, get off my lawn type situations because it's like, like you know the innovation does come from like you know young young people, right? So like you know I mean my dad always asked me like oh you know why don't you teach your teach your brothers how to draw and stuff? And I'm like like oh they're like you know 18 years and 20 years younger than me, so it's sort of like you know just let, let them do their thing. You know I don't want to start like setting up these rules in terms of like how they can like get into art. You know. Um, yeah. Because you know they'll find their own way, right? So I think you know, like for us, what we can do is to offer advice, you know, for for those moments when, you know, mm -hmm. they actually reach a challenge of you know, like, figuring out what to do with their own art, or like maybe like, you know, getting support or funding for their art, or you know, these like copyright issues and all these things that like, the pit, 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 pitfalls that we can help them avoid. Um, because when it comes to like what they actually want to do with their art, like they'll figure that out, right? And maybe you know, like the some the, the stuff we're talking about, maybe is to do with when they actually like have trouble figuring that out. We can help like yeah. offer some some um direction. But yeah, certainly not. Uh, I, don't, I I think it would be a bad. Yeah. Like I know. We, yeah, yeah, you're right. We we kind of game about fan up, fan up. But the other thing is, there is some great technique that comes with learning other people's art style, right? I mean, yeah. I understand it all the time. I mean, I I was drawing um. I think uh, John Byrne Wolverine, you know, mm. in the nineties, because I was at the War uh, comic books and people were wanting, uh, you know, to meet to do uh, fan art of Wolverine back then. You know, hundred dollars for the for a friggin', you know, a a two size Wolverine. Okay, sweet, because I wasn't doing anything else. So yeah, cool. Thanks for hundred bucks. <laughs> you know, but yeah, yeah so I understand. Learn from the best. We actually mean like learn, right? You know, not just right. like. You know, it's it's like think about why you what you do, you know the why. Um, yeah. And the other thing is that these guys, uh, they all these people are out there teaching their own YouTube videos on how to do the technique, how to learn. And I think there's no reason not to learn and you use their style to actually sharpen your own style. You know, sharpen your own stick. You know, to do yeah. the work. And I think it's it's such a. That's the other cool thing about. I mean, we talk about negative side of social media. The great thing about social media is so much easy access to so much learning and to so many professionals, you know, so quickly. Like, me, and you, you know, we talk about you're a professional. So I'm able to talk to you about running a freaking convention, right? We wouldn't, you know, when would we get to talk, um, have people to, uh, listen to something like this if we did not have social media, you know, and yeah, you know, yeah. so openly. And, um, and the other thing is, there's so much good that comes from it, but I think, um, yeah, I think the pitfalls are there. But at the end of the day, I'm still learning, man. <laughs> you know, I get my knuckles slapped every now and then from my own bosses, you know, and my own uh, uh, mates and say, "Yeah, I think you ran too fast on that. one. slow down. <laughs> you want too much. <laughs> you want too much too fast. Slow down." <laughs> You know, and so yeah, I understand it as well. So there is also even if you do get older, you still get slapped. <laughs> you know, and yeah. but it's the willingness to learn. I think um, that's one thing that we we sort of um, maybe are losing a side of so, to be willing to learn. Um, so I'm gonna let you get some um, get on with your evening, but Thank for you. the you've got five minutes. Oh, you've. I want your final words out of oh. all those, uh, your last words. So 
We do this with I, every guest. I thought that was just my last one. Um, no, I guess what I, mean, I mean, if we were to tie up what we discussed today, it really is like, um, you know, we, we would, I mean, you were just saying is that that's constant, you know, um, strive to, to keep learning, right? And learning is not just about, um, you know, you might watch, a you know, it might be a video tutorial these days. Um, like, so you you what what you usually access is already distilled information. Um, so, it, like in in every case, it's good to um, whether it's a some information someone else put out or your own personal experience. It's always good to take the time to unpack it and distill it and then turn it into your own, um, you know, knowledge and wisdom. And you know, hopefully that feeds into your uh, who you are as a person and your your life experience and you know your your art. Right. But that process of unpacking and then distilling is quite important. Um, that's like real learning, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, like try to apply that to everything that you do. And um, hopefully when someone else, someone else asks, oh, you know, tell me about your work and what you do, you'll be able to like, talk to it, right? And as you can see, like I'm still kind of going on tangents and I might get, you know, um, go around a few loops to try and like, explain why I do what I do or what I do, but um, hopefully I'll get better at it myself. So, you know, uh, that applies to my own work as well as, you know, um, things like Chromacon, right? So, yeah, I'm really excited to, um, I think the thing about Chromacon is every two years I get to see what everyone else is working on and like where their headspace is at and how they've involved, um, evolved as artists. And um, that's a huge like motivation for me to keep, you know, hosting Chromacon. <laughs> excellent. Is that, it's okay. excellent i was just um gonna mute myself there because yeah thank you so much now just in case for people who um uh, think about the art uh, the pet girl of saku raso it's an m15 no 14 14 age i think that's the thing the 14 so it's not an adult hentai type thing guys just in case because it said pet girl that's what i was like what's this about and then like you know it went on i was like it's very interesting to look at the um, process of an artist, which was kind of surprising to me. I didn't even think, I didn't even read the blurb or anything. It was just like, yep, let's go, you know, keep my mind off. So it's a great um, little anime um, series and um, in line with what we're talking about, which is what really surprised me. Um, I wasn't looking for it, it was there. And, and just um, to see amateur artists dealing with stuff and, you know, especially someone who's like well known in the fine art world, choosing their own path and going against that. It was quite surprising to me, but it's worthwhile watching the Pet Girls, Sakura Russo, and I don't even know why they call it Pet Girl, but I understand it when you watch it. It's like oh. and the other thing about it. It's okay. very interesting. It's like um, I think she's got autism. Oh. Um, yeah. It's it's kind of interesting because I, I, that's what I like about anime. Yeah, yeah it's, that's what I like about it's like anime is it's like uh, um, the whole manga and things that I just love so much because there's so many amazing, interesting stuff. It's not all about superheroes, mm. you know. I just yeah. get so bored of superheroes, oh, even though I'm writing. That's, a, that's a big right now. topic. We could we could do another podcast on that. Yeah. I think. Yeah. But yeah, so I think, um, thank you so much, Alan. I just really appreciate yeah, you taking time out. Yeah, it's a good chat. Yeah, we went two hours. We went yeah. for one, it was supposed to be one hour, went for two hours. But I mean, at the end of the day, I realized that um, there's so much we can go on talking about, but you gave us so much and, you know, uh, with all the information and stuff. And I'm looking forward to Chromacon next year. I'm going to make sure I get there and, um, <laughs> yeah. and get me a book. You know, and um, I hope everything goes well. Um, I'm glad your team's, you know, uh, you've got the support. And I think that's the thing that a lot of times when we get up here and we start talking, that people just see this face and they don't think about all the people behind us. And do you want to do a shout out to anybody, your teams? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, oh, there's so many people who helped us along the way with Chromacon. Um, mm -hmm. So our Facebook Twitter, Soons, um, uh, Akita, um, Penny, uh, Cornelius, who does our design, um, Edison, who does our web development, um, Bob, who does our like activations. Man, there's so many people. I could go on. Um, 
yeah, you know, we have a big group photo every year at Chromicon. So like everybody in that photo, basically. <laughs> um, all the artists, obviously, you know, and all the attendees to come along because, you know, this, obviously this, this, um, the, you know, that, that's the biggest proof of the impact that we're making, right? It's everyone who showed up to support us. So what, what, to, uh, what date is, have you set a date for next year? Yeah, was it? Um, not not quite yet, <laughs> just because of you know, um, COVID. It's a bit unpredictable at the moment, but uh, we'll we'll obviously yes. announce it way in advance when we're ready. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a struggle for a lot of businesses, and I'm I'm, I'm worried about this, a lot of business and all businesses shutting down as well, stores and stuff. But that's us for tonight, guys. Thank you to my guest, Alan. Um, much appreciate. Thanks, Aru. Really Thanks appreciate so it, man. Thank you for hanging out and for all your um, knowledge and information and all the best. And for everybody watching around, wherever you are, thank you for joining us. Hopefully you got something out of it. And if you're a young artist, hey, keep doing fan art, but learn technique. It's all about being original in the end because if you want to be in the game for about 20 years, you, you know, and be recognized for who you are, keep working at it. And like Alan said, there's three things, right? And I wrote it down in the chat there, uh, just so it's there. It is originality, technique, and professionalism. And sometimes your professionalism would get well, is might get you over the originality before that. So be professional about what you're doing, and remember, you're your best salesperson. So, and your art's what you're selling, and do it do it well. Good product, good sales pitch. And don't be a starving artist anymore. Learn business. Thank you, everybody. Kakite ano. See you next time.